Welcome to the NK Man podcast. I'm here with Richard Carter. What's up, buddy? Uh, I'm all good. How are you doing, Badir? Not bad. Thanks for coming on the podcast. Thank you for me. having me. Yeah. I'm excited because we're going to talk Bitcoin, I think. Uh, yeah, whatever you really want. I'm, <laughs> I'm interested to talk about anything as long as it's informative and I, I like grasping new concepts as well. Yeah. So how long have you been here from South Africa? So my wife and I arrived in Cayman uh, December last year, so that'll be 2023. So okay. we've been here just over th six months. Right. Okay. Mm. Um, we... Uh, she she actually managed to uh, get a kind of a transfer through PwC, okay, which is what really funded us to get over here. Okay, um, I uh, am myself an engineer, mechanical, at least from uh, what I was taught in university, and I didn't think it was going to be this hard to find a job hmm. in, on the islands. Right. But uh, after looking for quite a few months, the engineering and at least industrial sector isn't what I'm used to from back home. Yeah, I don't think so. No, not at all. <laughs> so um, I actually ended up becoming a tutor so mm -hmm. for math, science, any STEM subjects. I quite enjoy it. Right. And uh, I then now travel house to house uh, with uh, kids between uh, the ages of whatever, 18 to 10, anything like that, and just teach and talk math and science and help them out as much as I can, which has actually been quite good. So you teach them math and science. What science? Uh, anything that comes around. I mean, in the younger grades, science includes everything from biology to chemistry. But I mean, in the older grades, uh, specifically, I like to deal with more physics, let's say. Right. So engineering, mechanics-based questions. Right. That's at least where my, my skills lie. But in the younger grades, I can cover pretty much every, any topic. Right, right. So, yeah, huh. so, so just, did you ever think you were going to be tutoring like this? Or did it just kind of evolve when you got here? It, to came it out? evolved. Yeah. Uh, I, I was running out of options. I was going door to door to places. And I was now had to start looking at the box. Okay, what else can I do? Right, And right. Uh, this was actually a nice combination that allowed me to use a bit of the skills I have from not necessarily ex uh, industry experience, but at least from what I've learned in school and university. And also, um, it gives me a bit of time today. It's not a full-time job. It's a great. Right. Cool. Yeah. So cool, that's, cool. that's not what I'm doing. Right. This might be a good way to live. It's, it's, I mean, it's not too bad. I wish I could get uh, more paid, work? Paid a bit more, right. to be honest. Cayman's an expensive place. Sure. Oh, boy. Sure. <laughs> Most expensive in the world. Ting, oh, ting. Man, yeah. No, it's, it's rough, but it's a beautiful place. I've never seen such wonderful beaches before. Right. The water. Oh, it's fantastic. Yeah, man. So did you hear about Cayman before you moved to Cayman? Or did you ever think about Cayman? Or was it just one day your your girl comes home and is like, hey, PwC wants to send me to the Cayman Islands? Um, I think beforehand, I'd never really given it much of a thought. You always hear Cayman Islands for the tax, uh, tax free kind sure. of, uh, zones, right, let's right. call it. Um, so we always hear about it in movies, pop culture, whatever it might be. Um, and then, yeah, one day, uh, my then girlfriend came back from university, university was, no, she was actually working at PwC then. Mm. And she said, these people from Cayman Islands came and gave a presentation at the office this sounds really cool. What do you think? And that's okay. where it all started. Huh. Yeah. So huh. By, by the end of it, um, uh, we, we decided it's just too good, good of an opportunity to give up. I mean, cool. the experience that we've had even now in the last six months has just been, been unreal. Great. unreal. So were you working full time in South Africa at the time? And it, I was, yeah. yeah. So, I so was, you had to give that up. I had to. Um, <laughs> it wasn't, let's say, uh, I, in a way, I was very, very sad to give it up. But also very happy. It was a, a hard, hard job. I worked in a, in a company that m produced manufacturing lines for automotive plants all over the world. So for the likes of Volkswagen, uh, Audi, uh, there's a, a couple other ones, Ferusha, uh, a few ones in the US, anywhere mm -hmm. in the world, right. any, anywhere they manufacture any component that's got to do with a car, right. catalytic converters, powertrains, differential assemblies, we manufactured the production lines uh -huh. that then assembled their products on it. Really, really cool. I didn't know such a thing existed. So you created the lines in South Africa, exactly. and those lines were transported to the factories like in Germany or wherever? In, it was, it's exactly like that. It's the most insane logistical uh, hurdle, really. So you, we, what we happens is a customer comes to us. They say, okay, this is a product we need to manufacture like in two years' time or less. It mm -hmm. depends on how, how good they are at time managing. Right. And they say, okay, well, we need to this product to adhere to these criteria, give us some documents and some official stuff and say, and we need to build 100 a day hmm. or 100 an hour, mm -hmm. whatever the requirement is. And um, 
our then our design department actually goes and creates this line mm-hmm. in three D space. Mm-hmm. The customer reviews it, and if they give the okay, we then start building it. And we uh, would build a, a few of the items in house, but a lot of them would be outsourced. So we get components from also all over the world mm-hmm. because international companies, just to say Volkswagen for example, mm-hmm. have certain standards that they need to adhere mm-hmm. to. They'll only use robots from that company, or they'll only use components from this company. Right. So we have to adhere to those. So we have to get them specially brought into mm-hmm. South Africa. We then manufacture and assemble the entire production line on the floor there, mm-hmm. and we have a working production line hmm. for a good uh, two weeks, month, however long it takes. And we have to prove before we're allowed to ship the production line mm-hmm. that it runs, that it right. goes the amount of parts at the correct quality. Sure. Which is a task. Right. It's quite difficult right. because there's always things that changes. For sure. Halfway down the line, okay, well, the customer says, oh, but you also have to do this, by the way. Right. Everyone pulls their hair out and starts changing things. Right, and it's, yeah, right. It's, it's tricky. Huh. Um, and eventually it happens. We then pack, pack it into containers ship it out to, let's say, Germany, and um, uh, we send a team of people to go and actually install it to do the final commissioning, as we call it, and set it up the line, and there you go. It's definitely wow. not that easy. I'm breaking it down. Right, but right. But it's, it's, it's a very, very complex but rewarding task. It was difficult. It must take years to develop and build all those lines. Luckily, the company I worked for, were um, they have a decent amount of experience in it. So we right. have a, a lot of, let's say, uh, kind of, Systems in place. Systems in place. Right. So you've got basics, building blocks you almost right. utilize. And if you need to do something specific, you make the most amount of time for that. Right. And um, so that means it doesn't take at least years, but it does It does have a lead time definitely of between a year, year and a half, two years maybe. Huh. Sounds like a massive operation. How big was that company? Ooh, how do I compare it? Um, uh, Employee-wise, I think we had at least three, 400 people in Port Elizabeth. So that's where uh, where the company was at least based. We had a, another branch in India, which we did some uh, production lines over there as well, which I think was also three, 400. Crazy. And a big business, big yeah. business, big money, especially with these uh, automotive vehicles and the precision required and the the quality of the material. It's it puts a lot of confidence into my mind in how our cars are built. There right. are a lot of money and brains going to making that thing uh, economical right. for them and us right. and just all round well designed right is that super cool very very nice it, it was great work so I was sad to leave it but it was highly stressful real it, stressful yeah, yeah I'm sure it sounds like it so do they do those car companies design and manufacture those lines in South Africa because of labor costs um, the company started in South Africa I think purely because of our, our founders just being from there. I think they came up with at least our approach specifically to catalytic converters. Do you know what a catalytic converter I is? I do. I mean, in a simple sense. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. But, but we know it's a very, very simple item. But to assemble a catalytic converter is very, very difficult. Because if you compress it too much on one side while you're now compressing the tin to like squeeze it all in there, right. if you compress it too much on like one side, the gas just flows out the mat on the other right. and it's ineffective. It doesn't work. Right. You've got now know, thousands of dollars worth of plutonium or whatever's inside that thing is just a waste. So it's very, very difficult to manufacture, first off, and then additionally to that, to manufacture at scale. Right. So I think um, their big break was they managed to find a way to very economically produce lines to do this. Mm-hmm. Um and then just made it cheap for all manufacturers. Then. Kind of, yeah. We had a, a good process, a quality, um, a quality insured process, and I don't know whether it was necessarily cheap, but it was a better product overall, right. and that at least uh, boosted the company into right. the worldwide stage and got cool. everyone's attention. And they, they wanted to stay in South Africa. They're they're South Africans. Yeah, we ah, want okay, to keep it okay. There. That's cool. So it sounds like they had, um, you know, like more of a simple business product idea. Mm. Um, they made that work really well and then just kind of started scaling from there. Initially, it was definitely based um, in small scale automotive within the country. Mm-hmm. It, that, at least that's how the business started and it grew and grew and grew and then started accepting customers all over the world. So does South Africa manufacture cars? Uh, we do, yes. Uh, Port Elizabeth, where I'm from, is actually, we at least used to be a massive hub for uh, automotive production. Okay. Specifically in a little town called um, Utenag, which is quite close to Port Elizabeth. Um, we have a lot of plants over there, a big Volkswagen plant as well, actually, mm-hmm. 
that used to produce cars for the world. I think it's changed a lot now. They've moved production focuses to other countries, perhaps for labor reasons or materials or whatever it might be. Um, but yeah, it, uh, at least the Eastern Cape, which is where Port Elizabeth in our uh, province, was a very much a hub for production and mm. automotive capabilities, at least when I was young. Mm. Not too sure about now, really. Right, right. Huh. Yeah. So, I mean, that's quite the decision to, to move, to, to leave that and come to Cayman where... It was, it we was don't a have difficult a lot of manufacturing one. happening here. And I only really realized after being here for two or three months that I actually really, really miss that job. Yeah. I miss the people. I miss, even though the problems were hard, I miss the, the, the challenges. Mm -hmm. it's, I think I'm, I missed being part of that team, which was uh, tricky, but I'll get back to it eventually. I don't, know, I, don't, I don't know whether I'll go back to them. I don't think I will. Um, but I'll find my place again. Right, eventually. right. Yeah. No, I do also enjoy working with lots of people in a stressful. It brings out something in a team, right? It does. Yeah. It really does. And and then you you become like comrades with everyone exactly. else. Exactly. Exactly. Um, and you you sort of go through this tough experience together. You know, it's almost like going to war and well, coming yeah, I mean, back on the other side. Well, yeah, hectic uh, uh, comparison, but you are right. <laughs> right. It's, you've got to, got to go through this this difficulty to you know, really right. glue glues people together, whether right. it be in business or partnerships, or whatever it is. But right. going through something hard, it's the best glue almost. I love it, man. That's why I love films. You know, because that's the same thing. We we we. Tons of people work together, very intensive work on this project. And Timelines and deadlines for films must be actually insane as well. It is. And, and there's a, you know, this huge process, like, like anything, like anything mm -hmm. when you're manufacturing, you know, pre-production, production, post-production, post all these different people with different skills. Chopping and changing afterwards, changing Chopping minds. Chopping and changing, yeah, lot, definitely. That's a <laughs> yeah. big part of it. And um, always on tight deadlines, always on a tight always, budget. Always, always. You know, trying to be creative, but trying to be rational and logistical and... Yeah, it's it's quite the concept. Um, and just on the cherry on top, you've got your money. It's like, okay, have you run out of money? Nope. Okay, it's all good. Yeah. <laughs> Don't run out of money. <laughs> yeah. So, okay, so you moved to Cayman in December. So before you moved to Cayman, how far were you in your Bitcoin journey? Uh, so this no was less way. than a year ago. Yeah, no way. I... I knew of Bitcoin. I mean, everyone had heard by then of, oh, wow, it like went up hundreds and hundreds of percent or it crashed and burned. Now it's going to go to zero, whatever the case is. And right. I never really took much interest in it and actually really tried to understand it. I think partly because I was busy focusing on calorie converters at the time sure. and, and trying to understand that. But it was at least piqued my interest. I, I um, made some small investments into what I guess would be called an ETF at this point, uh, just not directly actually owning the Bitcoin itself, yeah. but investing in what it's doing and at least the price of it. Which product was that? Uh, it was through a product called Easy Equities in South Africa. So they mm. offered like a crypto bundle, which was, I think, actually initially a combination of like 40% Bitcoin, 40% Ethereum, and then 20% other stuff. Cool. So it was a nice initial, but, you know, of, oh, sure. this is what's happening. That's an entry point. You yeah, can say of, you have exposure. Something like that, right. yeah. I mean, it wasn't exactly much. It, I put what I could and what I thought I was willing to risk in that. At that point, I because I didn't understand crypto at all, I, I knew that I had to consider it as whatever I put in here, I might lose completely. Right. So I was like, right. okay, I'm going to assume I've just lost this amount of right. money. We're going right. to leave that and right. watch it. Right. So I was very, very cautious with that. Sure. Um, I think most people still have that feeling about and Bitcoin it's and probably still wise. It's yeah. still very volatile. It's still new. I definitely believe in future it's going to stabilize a hell of a lot. But for now, yeah, we're kind of still there. Right, right. And so when you came to Cayman, how how soon did you hit up the Bitcoin group? Um, I know you found see. us on Meetup. That's what you told us. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I we got to Cayman. I, I think I was driving myself and my partner crazy. So <laughs> I had to start finding um, things thing, to do, things to do, people to go for. At that point, I was um, uh, looking for a job as well, but it, of course, nothing came of it just yet. Um, so I started trying to find uh, groups to join, things to do. And they really, I mean, it's a small island. Don't get me wrong. There's mm -hmm. not many people here, but there wasn't much happening, at least that I could find. I mm -hmm. wasn't looking in the right places at that time. And I ended up bumping into this meetup group. I think I just searched for things on Google and the meetup application came up and in there, uh, along with one or two other IT technical events that were free, uh, this Bitcoin meetup popped up. And I, I pretty much just came to the first meeting just because, well, well what do I have to lose? Right. Even in the description, they say, yeah, anyone of all levels welcome. Like, right. great, I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> let's, let's do it, let's see right. what's about. 
So um, yeah, came to the meetup. It was really, really good. Yeah. Kenton actually, I think, initially got me hooked in that first meeting. He was telling me about how money has changed from the beginning when we used to do direct trades. So like between you got an apple, I want a carrot, you know, right. swap, we're happy. Bartering system. Yeah, pretty yeah. much, yeah. Uh, up until where we are now and how uh, the gold standard has changed and what fiat now is. It, it, uh, it got me very, very curious. Mm -hmm. And thanks to that, I actually started spending a lot of my free time uh, studying. So because I'm now looking for work, I didn't have a lot to actually do at the house. I could clean and cook and do the basic things, right. but I wasn't really putting my energy into anything. Right, right. So I actually signed up for a course on Coursera called, um, what was the exact name? It was something along the lines of an introduction to cryptocurrencies. Okay. Something like that. Yeah, it was yeah. a free course. So I was like, I'm cool. in. And that was like uh, eight, 12 weeks of just theoretical understanding of cryptocurrencies in general, though mm -hmm. it did mainly start with Bitcoin because mm -hmm. Bitcoin's like the big daddy. It's right. the main one. Um, and at least it came out first. Right. Uh, I think the course was made in 2016. So now doing it in 2024, there's a decent gap in technology sure. and, and uh, what's changed over the years. But it right. gave me a great fundamental understanding sure. of hashes and blockchains and, and keys and even security and a bit of finance as well. Mm -hmm. They touched on it a bit. Okay. And that, that now really got me into, now, okay, this actually is very, very cool. I love the technology. Right. Though I wasn't completely certain about financially what this is all about yet. Right. So that got me down the rabbit hole. And from then, I mean, that's, the rest is history, really. Yeah, yeah. It's now I've, I've, I've really become quite sold on the concept and the idea. I think it's a great idea, uh, Bitcoin in general. Like the, the the fundamental idea of what Bitcoin's meant to achieve. Yeah. Um, and I, I'm and really what's excited. That? Oof, uh, it's hard to put it in <laughs> words. Um, currently, my best understanding of it is uh, much like we were talking about uh, the bartering. So that's like direct exchanges. Uh huh. After that, it, bartering is, isn't really practical. If uh, let's say I'm a shoe salesman and you're I don't know you you, you have a house you want to sell. Right. I've got to like make. 10,000 shoes to give to you to not get this house. Right. Not very practical. Right. So instead you use um, intermediary uh, exchanges, which then uses something like a currency. Let's say whether it be glass beads, stones, whatever the case shells. was back in the day, shells, yeah. anything like that, anything that has value. Um, I use that as an intermediary to then make the transfer with you. So that's now uh, our currency. Right. Um, however, uh, I'm actually getting myself a little bit confused now. So I'm, I speak in a correction pretty much all the time. I'm still learning stuff. We're both new, buddy. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So uh, the idea with an intermediary, at least in common day and time, is if you're using cash, it works super, super well. Mm -hmm. um, if, I, if I came to you and I said, uh, uh, Badir, I, I want your audio equipment. Here's 10,000 Cayman dollars in cash. Happy, easy days. Transfer takes seconds. Everything's confirmed. You know that the money that you've gotten is real. I know that the product is real. Right. You know, we're all settled. But because of how the world works now, we aren't always in the same place at the same time. Right. So now we can start using uh, financial institutions, banks, uh, PayPal, credit card systems. But for those to work, so using anything without cash, you need this third trusted party, yep. right? And this is now where things get really interesting. <laughs> so... That means basically that both you and I, let's say if, we have, if I have a credit card, we both have to trust the bank. If you didn't trust the bank, you wouldn't trust the transaction, right? Correct. If I didn't trust the bank, I wouldn't trust the transaction. Correct. We wouldn't even have a card if we didn't trust the we bank. We wouldn't even have the card. Right. So the idea is that we both trust the bank. Right. And the bank essentially says, says uh, gives you an SMS and says, hey, Badir, the money's gotten into your account. Right. Okay, cool. And I'll take the thing. Right. That's now a transaction done. Right. Other than using cash, but right. we've used the third party that we both trust. Right. Um. Bitcoin is an additional way to do it other than cash or third parties. Right. And it's that, that's the cleanest way as I can explain it. So right. Now, you don't have to use cash, but you don't have to use third party either. Right. Um, well, now that we're talking about it, and, and, and I like that we're talking about it now because part of me trying to make sure that this is something I truly believe in in my head is to go through mm -hmm. these motions. Bitcoin itself is actually the third party, right. the blockchain, let's say. Right. As long as you trust the blockchain, then, then we're good, we're right. golden. And I've, I see no reason not to trust the blockchain at yeah. this point, at least yeah. the Bitcoin blockchain. The yeah. ones I'm not so sure about yet. Right, right, right. Um, and um, by using this now trustless 
system, right. as we call it, though right. we have to trust the blockchain, let's R say. Right. Um, you don't need the bank. Yeah. It's, it's fantastic. Yeah. Granted that there are technical um, reasons that, that let's say that each block only takes 10 minutes, right. longer or shorter, whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. um, those are all designed to work with the system and make it exactly as it is now. Right. It's so important. We had a conversation, I think a month ago, uh, I think you might have been there at uh, GT, mm -hmm. when uh, I think uh, myself and David, we started talking about the block size. Mm -hmm. and the oh, block, yeah. The, the block size wars came up and... I, um, I think Sam was, was not super keen on it. He kept saying, go to Bitcoin Cash, go to Bitcoin Cash. Right, right, I remember. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And initially I thought, well, it kind of makes sense to increase the block size potentially as, uh, I can't remember what it's called now. Um, in technology, you have a uh, exponential improvement in technologies. What's it called? Um, uh, it's... I can't remember what it's I called. We're remembering really, the conversation. We'll but yeah, this is the ex somewhere. exponential improvement. So in other yeah. words, data will become easier and easier to, Easy and easier to, to hold to, a box. To hold, exactly. Right. Essentially, each megabyte, each gigabyte costs less in dollars less. to maintain. Right. And it kind of makes sense. Well, why not just improve the block, si block size along with that increase? Correct. If anything, slightly under maybe. Right, right. And I've now somewhat changed my view. No, I don't think we should even do that because by doing that, you put a lot of uncertainty in the miners. So right now the miners are being rewarded via the new coins they make, right? right. But eventually when that stream runs dry, mm -hmm. whether it be at the end or halfway through, mm -hmm. if, if they just they aren't giving enough Bitcoin, right. that means that the block size is always increasing. Their rewards are always reducing effectively because more and more people can get into a block mm -hmm. and um, there's effectively less, I want to say, urgency to actually make a transaction. Mm -hmm. Right now, if I need to if I need to pay you a Bitcoin right now, I have to give a high fee to mm -hmm. make sure I'm included in the next block. Mm -hmm. But if there's no urgency, why even pay a fee? Mm -hmm. That's the idea. You see, I thought that if the blocks were bigger, they could hold more transactions and therefore the miners could get paid more. You're right. And this is now actually where the discussion really right. lies. You can now include more transactions in a block, but imagine and let's do a thought experiment. Sure. I like doing thought Me experiments. Me too. They're great. So imagine we have a super, super small block. We can like fit one transaction. Mm -hmm. Super high fees. Everyone wants to get into that block. Take years for you to do a transaction. Right. If, if even then. Okay. That's the extreme scenario. Okay. The miners make serious cash dollars. Right. They're, they're raking it in. Um, if we have a super massive block size, mm -hmm. let's say enough that anyone who wants to make a transaction in 10 minutes is able to get in there wouldn't be any fees. Right. I that's, see what you're saying there. That, that's kind of what's just cheaper happen. real estate. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. There's too much space effectively. And if there's too much space, that means the miners aren't getting paid. And if the miners aren't getting paid by the block reward, which will eventually stop and not be able to um, make it uh, or give them enough uh, kind of benefit for actually being miners, the system kind of crashes. Mm -hmm. And my, the counter argument to this is that, well, let's say that does happen. Miners now start falling overboard. They aren't profitable anymore. The hash rate will start reducing. The, uh, the automatic difficulty will start re reducing, reducing as right. well. Uh, I'm trying to think. No, eventually you'd come to the scenario now where you've got one miner doing all the transactions on a super easy, um, a super easy, let's say, difficulty, so, and, and right. everything just falls to pieces. That's effectively what happens. You kind of have to make it difficult to get into a block. a block, but also not too difficult. Right. It's a difficult balance. Yeah, I think, but it is a balance. I feel like the balance, if we are going to increase block size, and I'm not saying that we should, but I feel like it has to keep in mind the amount of transactions on the network, right? I mean, if there's um, huge amounts of transactions that just cannot get through for whatever reason, and it's slowing down the network, and you know, then maybe that's at the same that point, kind of problem. Yeah, then then, then, then people can just can't the use the system. It's not practical, right? Right. right. Um, and and I think what you're saying is completely valid. And in that scenario, the only way I can imagine getting the best of both worlds here is by putting this through the um, what's it called, the Bitcoin, bit, bit, the Bitcoin improvement protocols. Mm -hmm. Do you know how those work? No, they're super cool. So. Uh, Bitcoin fundamentally came out and this is the code for it. Open source, everyone knows how it works. Right, so now, how do we make this better? Over time, things change, computers improve, we have different ideas, things that maybe work better. Um, so the community that kind of controls the code, at least right now for Bitcoin, at least the, the current open source version we use, um, they 
have a process called a BIP, which stands for in Bitcoin Improvement Protocol. And mm -hmm. then at the end of that, you have a number, mm -hmm. 31, 93, whatever the case is. Mm -hmm. Each BIP can be uh, submitted by anyone. Mm -hmm. If you have a great idea for Bitcoin, you can submit a BIP. Mm -hmm. And then the community reviews it and either accepts or rejects it. Mm -hmm. So the idea is that if you have a great idea, or let's just, say, let's just stick with our, our block size uh, mm -hmm. uh, scenario. Let's say you believe no. We've got a massive problem over here. The block size is not big enough. We're losing transaction volume, which is going, this is putting stress on the network. It could be a problem. You say, okay, guys, I think we should increase the block size from, uh, I think it's four megs right now, two megs, I can't remember. Right. Uh, let's say from four megs to 10 megs. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's a big jump. You mm -hmm. say, okay, this is what I want to do. Mm -hmm. Immediately we get shot down by everyone because right. this has really been discussed a right. lot. But if you can provide enough evidence, let's say you can do analysis and say, okay, well, if we do this right now, we're still going to have at least 10 blocks filled consistently due to, up, uh, let's say, um, transactions that are waiting to be mined, Right. it's still worthwhile enough for the blockchain as a whole, for everyone using this to do this. If you can prove that in the BIP, people will listen to you. Mm -hmm. And if they listen to you, they put it in. So this now relies on, the, let's say, the Bitcoin community right now. Mm -hmm. And the beautiful thing about this is that if the community let's say, doesn't believe you, and you think, ah, oh, everyone hates me. They just don't like Badir. They just, whatever I put, doesn't matter if I put the best thing on that, but it in the world, rejected. Just, they just hate me. They just reject it. They don't care what it is. Then you fork Bitcoin. Right. And and that's the most beautiful thing. So now you take Bitcoin and you run your own line. Version, yeah. And it's, it's tricky now because now things get difficult. But if you have enough people on your side that believe that you are right, not just because you're wrong because you're Badir, right. if you believe you're right, you can become the longest chain and now everyone believes you. Right. If you have a good enough idea enough to persuade anyone. Right. And that's kind of the, the, the right thing to evaluate, right? Right, right. If everyone in the community believes we should now increase the block size to 10, then, then that's we do it. the way we do it. Right, right. It's very democratic. It's, it's like even more than democratic. Imagine if we had a, a system inside, uh, let's say, what the, uh, the developers now choose. Let's say we ever can vote, granted. And, but even if we don't believe in that system, we can still do it the other way around. Right. It's right. great. Yeah. It, it really works very, very nicely. Yeah. Um, so I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a big, uh, I really like the idea of how that's done. Yeah. yeah. I've yeah, yeah. lost now. What were we talking about? Oh, block sizes. And block sizes. Yeah. I <laughs> the mean, hot topic. Yeah, it is. I heard yeah. there was a book actually that came out about that, but I didn't read it. I want to read it. The Block Size Wars, I think is probably what it's called. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I've heard it mentioned a couple of times. I hear it's actually a good read. One of the guys from the meeting said it's a really good read. Oh, man. But I, I, need, do wanna, I, to. I do want to go through that and have a read because to keep on the block size, part of me is kind of with um, um, Sam and like, let's not increase it. And the reason is because of the the second layer um, protocols. This is like another can of worms you just open here, right. Yeah, right? Which can, um, you know, I guess they have their channels or whatever it's called where mm -hmm. they, you know, they can spread the Bitcoin around and then at the end of the day, they settle yeah, exactly, on, the, exactly. on, the, on the first layer network. So I'm like, okay, that's kind of happening now with Lightning. Some people are using it. Some people like it. Some people don't like it as much. I love it. It's great. Right? So I'm like... Well, if that's happening, then what's the point of increasing the block size? Like if we can have these layer twos and layer threes and they make it more efficient and you can still transact and then the settlement happens on the bottom layer in the in the background, then there's no need. Even better. Cheaper transactions. Everything is just much, much more efficient. Right. The problem right. The problem with uh, Bitcoin's decentralization is that it's really, really inefficient. Like if you think about it, uh, mm -hmm. uh, let's say MasterCard, for example, they've probably got servers all over the world, but they've definitely got like centralization as much as they can. The more you centralize something, the more efficient it is, right? Yeah, yeah. You don't need to maintain 10 different computers around the world when you can just maintain one that's maybe slightly bigger. Right. So right. the blockchain itself is by nature, by its design, horribly inefficient. Right. But it's what's needed for something like this. Right. And what we spoke about previously in the block size is, is not even considering layer twos. And I completely agree with you. Right. A layer two solution to a block size problem is a great one, mm -hmm. at least from what I fundamentally understand right now. Right. Is that my chair squeaking? It's probably mine. It's yours. <laughs> oh, wait, I can hear it, yours. <laughs> um, so I, I, I actually second that completely. Something like Lightning, and even and people have spoken about layer threes on top of that, is even better. Because right. along with now settling transactions once a day, once a week, once a month on the chain, mm -hmm. whatever is practical, mm -hmm. having lower fees on the layer two included, um, you can 
Uh, you can even separate your sats smaller if you need to. Let's say Bitcoin does increase to however many is predicted, millions of dollars per coin. Right. Your sats are now going to become worth too much to have a, uh, the technical word is scalability, I think, to have mm. good scalability on it. If I want to buy a suite from you, which costs, let's say, 50 cents right now, mm -hmm. if I can't split my sats small enough to pay for that, that's a problem. Right. But layer twos don't necessarily have to abide to the one Satoshi minimum or rather smallest unit as a blockchain does, they can use smaller units. Right, right. Um, which so, works. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it would be helpful even in that uh, scenario of hyper-Bitcoinization, a million yeah. a coin, um, these layer twos, layer threes can, um, I guess, micro-cut exactly. you know, the, the Bitcoin it's, it's, and, and make it more usable for everyone, mm, it's like more, for smaller transactions. Yeah, it's, it's more, I, I guess, I guess it's more centralized. So in a way, it's not as good as having a blockchain transaction. The pure, the best thing that we have is like doing a block uh, transaction on the Bitcoin blockchain. Right. That's right. like, that's just the, the golden bar. That's it. That's yeah. what you do. Everything kind of like just steps down from that a little yeah. bit, but I mean, not noticeably. I heard, uh, I don't know if it was in one of our meetings or whatever, but somebody said that, you know, those of us who have used the layer one mm -hmm. um, blockchain to send transactions, you know, we're going to look back on this. <laughs> it's like, do you remember back in the day when we used to send uh, transactions on, 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 on layer one, you know, because that won't be a thing maybe 10, 15, 20 years from that, now, right? That, that thought crossed my mind. I, I donated to Sam a thousand sats for the sticker I, I got on Thursday night. And, uh -huh. and like when I was walking back to my seat, I thought, how much could this be worth in the next few right. years? Maybe it's, I mean, it's like 20, 20 cents in America, in Cayman dollars, sorry, right. US dollars now. It's right, just about nothing to us, but it's in the future potentially a lot more. Sure, I don't like um, spending sats. I, I know a lot of Bitcoiners <laughs> do, and they do want to, hmm. you know, like stimulate the spending and the circular economies and stuff like that. But um, um, I'm not quite there with them yet. You know, it's like savings technology. You don't yeah, why are you yeah. spending your savings, right? I, Even I, if it's a thousand sats, like you know. yeah. It, I mean, it, it ideally would be great to. What's the saying? Go stack your sats. Yeah, <laughs> something like that. Uh -huh. It would be great to um, to to hold on to them completely. But I, I I can definitely understand that there's there's value in transacting it. Sure, you, just, you promote it. You yeah, and it. it's it's a great feeling to spend something and buy something with sats, and I've done it as well. Without the banks, it's freaking wonderful. Yeah, I mean, it's, I, it's beautiful. The, the majority of the uh, Bitcoin, the, all of the Bitcoin that I have, is it comes from South African rand. So I have some savings in South Africa, and rand is the fiat, right? Yeah, rand is fiat. Right. It's our, our currency in South Africa. Right. Um, I had rands saved in some investments, and actually in some of that original Bitcoin kind of ETF-like thing I told mm -hmm, you about. Right. So I decided one day after understanding enough of this, let's get this into actual Bitcoin. I know this isn't, but let me actually try to set this right. up. And I started moving the money around. I got into some Bitcoin. And because it's not a geographical thing, it was so great because I put it into my wallet and I, I went and I bought something here. Right. So this money wasn't, the wealth was in South Africa. Right. I didn't have to go through anything to right. get it here and just buy a fridge magnet. Right. Which yeah. Which was great. It's a great feeling. I mean, one of the first, I, before I got into, before I fell down the rabbit hole, became orange pilled, and I, I did have a, I did buy some Bitcoin and it was that first purchase where I was like, wow, I just, that's I just did this. So yeah, that's it. Like, <laughs> yeah. you know, like and th there was no bank involved. And um, that, that was just, that was a real cool feeling, mm. you know. Um, um, back in the day, specifically before Bitcoin, I think, went to whatever the price is now, let's say 2012, 2014 levels, I can definitely believe, well, what am I actually saying? I actually might be completely wrong, but I can believe that the, the fraction of transacting, the cost of transacting was super, super low. Right. Right now, it's low, right. but it isn't super low. It right. at least cost me a few, a dollar or two maybe to move the RAND as value and completely to here, just in blockchain fees right. and stuff, but way better than bank transactions, yeah, most man. definitely. Anyways. I mean, I mean, it's not only just the fees with the banks, it's just the headache hmm. with them. I mean, filling out a wire transfer form, it's, it's like they don't even know what they're we doing. We tried to do it, and we like we lost money in the process. The yeah. money that like, goes somewhere else, like where the hell and are we going? And the oh, bank's like, we didn't. I don't know. Yeah, you, you have you to check do that it right. <laughs> yeah. And then it's, you ask them like, what's what's ABA? What's the routing number? What's the SWIFT code? And they're just like, ah, your guess is as good as mine. Pretty much, yeah. Figure it out, buddy. Put it in, see where it goes. Surely yeah. you got lots of money to waste doing this. <laughs> no. <laughs> and it always gets lost in a. A third party bank somewhere, oh, you know, yeah. it's like in some random bank. It didn't reach our bank, so it's in this middle bank. It's Everyone's like, got their fingers in the pie, it seems. It's, yeah. it's quite a pain. 
It is. I mean, you know, on one hand, like you were saying, centralization does make things more efficient. But on the other hand, it doesn't as well. You know, there's like a there's a point where centralization stops working, mm. I think, you know. Um, and I think, you know, when you look at the banks and, and stuff like that, I think we're past that now. It's just it's just a headache. Everyone, you know, has a headache with the banks. Um, but yeah, so... Um, where, so, okay, so when was your orange pill moment? So when was that first meeting you went to? It was giant. So you came in December last year. Yeah. We're so in July now. It must have been, January, I, want to say, I want to say end of Jan, maybe end of Feb. I can't exactly remember. And I think that's when I met months. you. I think. I'm pretty sure I did meet you. Yeah, on that meeting. first yeah, one. Yeah. Um, I think you had seen one of my podcasts. I think because you you said hi to me and I wasn't quite sure who you were. I, I think I watched like yours with uh, maybe Kenton. Kenton, yeah, I was yeah. with Kenton, which was very interesting. Yeah, um, yeah, man, Kenton's great. You know, he's he's been in this for a while. Super he's, knowledgeable. Yeah, man, he's he's great to talk to. I know he's into his Thor chain. Do you know much about that? I tried to get into a bit of it, and I actually put a very very small amount of money into this yield kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it's completely based on it now. We're talking different blockchains, different ideologies. It's Super, super different. Yeah. Um, and I've, I've tried it out. I'm seeing what's happening. I haven't, I haven't actually checked recently. You yeah. reminded me. Thank you. So yeah. I must go back and just have a look and see if it's actually grown. Yeah, yeah. I've no. like stored USDT in this yield generating portfolio thing that okay. just makes money. And yeah, no. And is that in a wallet? It's. Um, or it's an exchange? Technically, it's been put into an exchange, I believe. So it's gone from a wallet to there. So, I mean, I've broken all the laws of Bitcoin by now. <laughs> but that's not Bitcoin, though, is it? It's not Bitcoin. All that's right. the thing. And you've actually picked up on an interesting topic, which maybe we can talk about. Uh -huh. um, but, uh, yeah, so I'm trying it out, see how it goes. Thought chain, fundamentally, the way Kenton understands it, really makes a lot of sense. Uh -huh. But you have to have a reasonable amount of value to put into the system to make it work for you. Right. Um, but conceptually and theoretically, it Kind of makes sense to me. Right. I haven't been able to practically test it though. Not right. Yet. Yeah. So yeah. Neither have I. Down the road. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. You know, I'm still trying to figure out Bitcoin. I mean, there's just so much to it, right? It is a never-ending hole. Yeah. It doesn't end. I haven't found the bottom yet. <laughs> I mean, everyone who says they haven't found the bottom yet, like, they, no one's, no one's like, yeah, you know, I got. It. I always wonder if Satoshi fell down the rabbit hole too. In other words, after he created it and put it all together, Did and he put even it, realized what he made. Right. That's an interesting thought. Yeah, I wonder because I mean, there's so much you can you can extract from what he's done, from what he said, from his white paper, from everything about it. Right. Um, but yeah, you, you, know, you can extract it from him. It doesn't mean it's there. Yeah. But you can extract it from that. You yeah. can like say, yeah, he def definitely meant that. Yeah. Miles Toshi's like, yeah, like a guess. Like, yeah. <laughs> maybe, maybe he was a super smart dude. Yeah. I mean, wish we could know, but. Yeah, you know, I had this exam when I was a when I was in high school. I wrote this paper once, and I was never very good in in my English class. It was always my worst class. But we had this paper, and I wrote this paper, and it, I guess it was just way out of left field. It was like a creative writing thing. And um, my teacher s told me in front of the class, "In your exam, do not write this paper. You will fail your exam." <laughs> She's like, "But I'm going to read it to the class." Yeah. And so she read it to the class, and. The class then started interpreting this paper. Yeah. And they put all of these deep thoughts into like what I was trying to say. And I just sat there, you know, I didn't I didn't actually intend to say any of that, but they put so much <laughs> yeah, into yeah. it. It was a cool paper that they enjoyed and, and it spoke to them. And even though I didn't mean to put that in there, maybe unconsciously I did or you know, maybe it was in there whether I decided to put it in there or not, but they extracted all this information from Happy it. Happy accident. Yeah, <laughs> uh, it, exactly. And I wonder if, you know, Bitcoin was similar to that. If, if Satoshi's, you know, sitting around looking at everything happening and saying, you know, I, I didn't intend for all of this. I didn't see all of this. Maybe. Or I'm, at least certain bits of it, you know, maybe the ETFs or whatever it is. You yeah, know? I, I doubt you can see that far into the future in that kind of detail to know what's happening right. with the ETFs, for example. Right. But um, something actually that you now mentioned, which I think might be good to talk about, is proof of work. Right. How much do you know about proof of work? I mean, not much. I'm, I'm a newbie still, but um, I love it. I love the phrase. Uh. I think the phrase transcends Bitcoin just to life. Um, it's, it's such a crucial part I've now discovered, and I, I can owe this discovery to um, Bitcoin Prague happened a f month or two ago. I don't mm -hmm. know if you ever watched any of those keynote speakers. I did. Uh, the second one. 
That's all I can remember. I can't remember oh, his name it? now. Yeah. Uh, it's, it, was it, that about proof of work? It was about proof of work. It was about it what wasn't makes, Jack Mallers. It could have been Jack Mallers. Okay. Could okay. have been Jack Mallers. It was about why is how is Bitcoin now different to the rest of the crypto cryptocurrencies? Okay. okay. What is the actual difference here? It's not just that they came first, something's different, right? right? And his old talk was about uh, proof of work right. and what it actually means for Bitcoin. Yes, let's talk about this. Really good. Mm -hmm. Like his his uh, idea of of what exactly is happening and how Bitcoin is physically tied to the real world. Right. This is was Mallers. Fundamental. Yeah. Right. It's like it, that. That blew my mind. I was yeah. Like, this is, this makes a lot of sense. Now. Yeah. Um, and it makes sense why Bitcoin's done so well. Why and, it survived. And let's talk about that to to those who may not know. What what did Mallers say in that keynote that What's so important about proof of work? Because from what I understand with proof of work, it connects Bitcoin, this digital coin, to the real world. Mm, exactly. Why is that important? Well, I think Because of, Ethereum can't say the same anymore. It used to be proof of organized proof of stake and the yeah, proof of stake, yeah, yeah. they're not connected to the real world. To the real really? world. No. So why is that important? So um, I'm going to steal a bit of what he spoke about because I think he did it really, really well. Yeah. So I apologize to him in advance. No, I'm sure he doesn't mind. It was It's just really well put. Um, so You're on the edge of the camera there. Am I? Oh, yeah, I'm leaning you're off. good, you're good. Almost there, almost there. Before we get into this proof of work. So yeah, so tell me. One of the things I'll, I'll chat about first is that, let me ask you, what, what, what is money? Now, the most horrible question in the world. Open-ended. What, what is money? What is value? So I use sailor's analogy. Uh -huh. It's economic energy. That makes sense to me. I can I can use that as an analogy. Yeah, that's actually what I was kind of going for. Uh -huh. Value, uh, money is, you can think of it as time, as the time you've put into something to go and make something that is actually of value to others around you. Right. You've put time, you've put energy into it. But the nicest one is the way sailor put it, is it's, it's a form of energy. Mm -hmm. You've now... You've used what limited time you have on this earth to do this thing, mm -hmm. and you've burned calories doing it. Probably, if we're talking yeah. in a physical sense, right, right. Um, so, energy is a great way to think about it. Yeah. Um, so, when you have a, a digital document, let's say you've made a PDF of uh, or a word document of whatever we're talking about today, this this, this contract over here. Mm -hmm. You can copy and paste it as many times as you want, right? Mm -hmm. They're physically, uh, technically identical. Mm -hmm. So now, how do you use a system in this magical internet that can't be copied like mm -hmm, that? Mm -hmm. That's like a key point about it. Mm -hmm. That's why we couldn't make money before, because it could yeah. just be copied and copied and copied, just right? Just copied. I think it's, it technically ties into the double, send, double spend problem, right? where now if you send money to two people at the same time, how on earth is someone meant to verify that they've gotten the real money if there's no intermediary? Correct. And that's why banks were so important and are still important now. I because mean, they solve that problem. They solve that problem, right? right? Um, with their ledger. With their All right. But now we know Bitcoin also solves that problem. Way better. Um, and it uses proof of work to do so? Exactly. So now, um, I guess the best thing to do is let's chat about proof of work and then we'll talk about why it's different to proof of stake. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of different proofs of things as well. That's true. It's I don't only know those about two. the rest of them. Right. I, I don't either. I know they those. could have some good ideas with them, but right sure. now proof of work is just, it makes a lot of sense right. to me. So the idea is um, if you can copy and paste something in the internet, what does that cost you right now? Electrons Nothing. of power. Yeah. That's it. It costs me this. Yeah, command C, command V. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. But if you were able to complete a transaction that cost you nothing, why not just do it indefinitely? Mm -hmm. So having something like the proof of work scenario is so great because it means that nobody can just add something to the blockchain without having to put the work in. Mm -hmm. And the work in that scenario is described as electrical energy. Mm -hmm. So theoretically and statistically and everything that Hal Satoshi has made this is that unless you utilize a prerequisite amount of electrical power, you statistically have a zero probability of adding a transaction to the blockchain illegally, mm -hmm. essentially. Right. And whatever's on the blockchain can be validated about as easily as a copy-paste. Mm -hmm. That's like the key difference. It must be super hard to add, mm -hmm. but really easy to check. Mm -hmm. And that's the, the kind of the fundamental concept of don't, what's it called? Don't trust validate. Don't trust verify. Verify, that's yeah. one, sorry. Um, so everything must be verifiable with minimal to no power usage mm -hmm. or energy or processing, whatever it is, mm -hmm. but it must be difficult to do it. Mm -hmm. And that difficulty and that tying that difficulty to the real world is a real key 
Because imagine if that difficulty was just your stake in Bitcoin. If you owned 100 Bitcoins, it was that difficult for you. But if I own 10 Bitcoins, it's more difficult for me mm -hmm. to validate something because mm -hmm. I have less of a stake. Mm -hmm. Sure, that could work for some things if you care about a company. Much, I, I guess I could compare it to, um, what, what are they called? Uh, uh, partners having shares in a company. Right. If I have a 6% share, you have a 40, I kind of make the calls because right. I've got the majority of the right. shares. Right, right. Um, that works in some scenarios, sure, but not here. Yeah, because imagine if somebody had. It's, I mean, how many how many Bitcoin does BlackRock have now? Uh, hundreds, hundreds of thousands. Of thousands yeah. yeah, they have a majority say effectively in the network. Right. If the system if it was, was based on that, yeah. then suddenly BlackRock buys all the coins, and they're like, "No, okay, we're doing this," and they just change everything about it, making a banking system again. Yeah. So let me ask you this: with the proof of work, now mm -hmm. with the proof of work. Proof of work doesn't affect me when I need to buy Bitcoin or I don't need to prove the work when I buy Bitcoin or when I sell it. From what I understand, mm -hmm. it's the miners that have to prove the work. So exactly, yeah. the proof of work, it's it's on the burden of the miners. Why is that? Uh, because the nodes also don't need proof of work. Yeah, the nodes don't need either. Fundamentally, a node and a miner are almost the same thing, which I, I can't tell you why that is, mm -hmm. but I, I think that's a fact. Mm -hmm. um, the miners are just more designed and optimized to do the mining part, whereas the nodes are more designed and optimized to do the noding part, mm -hmm. where it's like talk, uh, reciprocating new blocks, new blocks, transactions right. through the network, right. right? Whereas miners are purposefully designed to solve real complex math problems, right? right? right. Um, so your question was, why do you as a uh, a node or a buyer not have to worry about that. Right. But it's it the the people who process the transactions, which are the miners, mm -hmm. they're the ones that have to have um have to approved the work. And I'm I was thinking about this maybe even this morning when I was driving, I was like w the purpose of the miners is to mine the block so that those transactions can go through. Mm -hmm. So for some reason Satoshi want uh, what the question I was asking myself when I was driving is why don't the transactions just go through automatically? Why does it need a miner to prove the work to solve the puzzle to allow those transactions to well, go through? So this is the exact now kind of 180 back to where we started. Why proof of work is so important? Because uh -huh. imagine if you had a, a a node on your phone and you could just add a transaction to the blockchain. That's really easy, but too easy. You haven't done the work effectively. So now, if you mm -hmm. could add um, a transaction to a blockchain, ugh, how, how do I describe this blockchain? Someone's going to have to correct me because I don't think I understand this conception mm -hmm. well enough. But you've got to be able, how do, you, how do you choose who gets to add the new block? Right. There's only one chain, right? Right. Whoever gets to add the new block, who's ever solves the puzzle first. Right. And more and more people want to solve the puzzle now because the reward for the puzzle is better and better, right. Right. including the fees and stuff. Right. Right. Um, so I guess that's the answer. If you're, if you want to win the puzzle, you got to put the work in as well as everybody else does. Let's just say, for example, sake, um, we're back in 2008, and Bitcoin's just started. No one's these mana, and you come along and say, "This is pretty cool. You just plug your laptop in and just start mining Bitcoin. You'd, you'd release every single block. You'd get every single reward. It'd be great, right? Because you're the only one there, right? So there's there's like there's no end usage. I guess right. like this, Satoshi when it first went exactly, up. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And, and this is, I guess, where the, the, the difficulty adjustment comes in. That's, I guess, a key role at this right, place here. Right. But the more people that want to get that reward, the more everyone has to work. Right, because the difficulty adjustment goes up. Exactly, yeah. And, and it's actually securing the network more and more. Right. Because imagine, imagine if you're a mining farm and you've not, you're putting gigawatts of power into mining the stuff. You're very incentivized to make sure that Bitcoin network continues indefinitely into the future, right? right. You're not earning dollars, you're earning Bitcoin. Right. But they earn dollars as well, right? Oh, yeah, they trade, they trade right. the dollars for Bitcoin, right? They well, I think they, uh, the fee subsidy as well, or the subsidy is the Bitcoin, I think. But they also get the transaction fees that are included in the... What subsidies do you mean? Uh, so, like, you know, when you send a Bitcoin transaction, mm -hmm. there's a fee that you pay yeah, yeah, yeah. that goes to the miner. Okay, that's all on Bitcoin, that right? So they, they, they're only earning Bitcoin and then they go and sell some of that for their dollars. I, I thought that they, they get both things. I thought they get Bitcoin and money. And a question that I always had was how do they get that actually mo that money? How do they get the, the fiat? 
As far as I know, they don't get any It's fiat. just Bitcoin? I think they just get huh. Bitcoin. Which is Someone out there, let us know. <laughs> Please, yeah, correct us if we're wrong. <laughs> yeah. But it's, as okay. far as I understand, it's just Bitcoin. Right, because I guess when you send a transaction and it's it costs a, Bitcoin, a dollar, right? it's, a, it's a bit of Bitcoin, yeah. right? Yeah. Huh. Exactly. So I mean, the, the dollar value is just nice because we are right now very used to working in dollars, mm -hmm. or rand in my case. Right. But um, because we're working this currency, it's just conceptually easier for us to quantify how much something is. If I tell you how much is 10,000 sats worth, it's a little bit hard for you to tell me. We know sure. it's actually worth a bottle of water. Right. Like it sounds like it could be a lot. It's a car. Right, right. right. But right now, dollars are easy to work, and that's right. why we often talk about it. Right. Like in the mempool, it's, it's great to see um, the number of sats and then just the dollar value next to it, which right. is just useful for us. Ah, right is now. that right? The mempool shows that? It's huh. super. I love the mem mempool. It's great. Okay. Because it also helped me visualize and understand exactly what's happening when each block gets right. added. Right. I, like I should see. spend some time in there. I just sit and watch the thing. <laughs> <laughs> the block just keeps going. <laughs> just keeps on going. Uh, tick tock. Next block. Yeah, it's, exactly. it's super beautiful. Yeah. Um, I love that it didn't go down when Microsoft crashed yesterday. That's no, fine. Like, <laughs> well, at least you know, the Bitcoin. Bitcoin doesn't run on Microsoft. Right. Right. Well, actually, I didn't know. You know, I didn't know. Obviously, I know there's tons of nodes, tons of miners. Mm. I'm like, is there any Microsoft involved in well, the nodes? Well, I guess it, it, it very well could be. Depends right. on who determines or right. how everyone chooses to use it. Right. You actually make a good point there. There should have been a noticeable drop in connected nodes around the world. And I would be very curious to go check that out after this. Me too. Me Mem too. Mempool itself has got a lot of good graphics of on it, hmm. you can actually go find that kind of, kind of information, hash rates over time and right. nodes connected and stuff like that. Let's talk about the mempools a bit mm. for those who don't understand. Oh, wait, sorry. Before we do, yeah. um, I'm, I'm going to tie myself back to, to the proof of work. To the proof of work. Yeah, I know yeah. we didn't quite finish we that. Quite, I'm just going to yeah. tie it in a bow quickly yeah. and we can go to mempool. Um, okay, so proof of work, really, really important because it physically tethers Bitcoin to the real world. If yes. nobody spends electricity, nobody can make transactions. That's kind of the key here. But why is that important? Why, do, why can't the transactions just happen and without somebody making them happen, I guess. I, I can't see that. Uh, like, I can't answer your question, but I can tell you about, uh, I've forgotten his name already, who, the guy who did the presentation. Jack Mahler's Jack he Mahler's, owns yeah. Strike. Yeah, yeah. I, is, uh, I can tell you app. what he said, said about um, proof of stake right. and the analogy that he used, which really works quite well. Which was? Um, how much power does uh, Elon Musk have right now? Like power, he's, he's got a lot of wealth, right? Yeah. He's got money. He can do stuff. He can make stuff happen. Yeah, um, got a lot of power. I would he's say he's got a lot of power. Yeah. yeah. Or, or, or actually, better example, a king. Let's just say a king. Yeah. Uh, king's a lot of power. I know yeah. they, they don't nowadays, but let's just say a king used to have a lot of power, physical power. He sure. was in charge. Sure. How much power does Mark Zuckerberg have? He's Every got a lot of money as well. Right. Let's ignore it. He doesn't right. have because, that because uh, money is. Economic energy, power, yeah, so exactly. it it's does power. translate. The idea is that Mark Zuckerberg has a lot of power because we utilize Facebook. Correct. He's got kind of like power on us over that through right. manipulation, let's say, through just just Having being, our data. Oh, he has our data. It. He, he has something that we want, which right. is his service. Right. Um, but the key thing here is that if you take away uh, Zuckerberg's Facebook, he doesn't really have any power besides money, let's say, he has. Right. But it, you can't really take away the king's power. He's the king. You've got to you've got to murder him. <laughs> got to take his throne. That power stays there still effectively. Right. I think that's the idea between if you tie something to the real world, it's kind of like having real power. Let's say wealth or king. I'm right. I'm, I'm, I'm causing sacrilege. This thing. It's all but good. Real power, that kind of thing. But if you have a fictitious power, almost like a make believe power in the metaverse. Right. You're only powerful there. Right. And that's the idea between proof of stake. Proof of stake works really, really well, and it's super efficient because right. you don't have to spend gigawatts of power right. mining it, right? right. right. Which, which right. is seen as a massive, massive problem. Right. And it is, but it's also what makes the system work. But with proof of stake, you can um, have your say depending on how much Ethereum you own. And it works for certain scenarios, and I, I do believe Ethereum has a part to play in the future. Mm -hmm. um, how it runs... Uh, how you can create a virtual machine on it is fundamentally great. I'm sure we're going to use it for a long time to come, mm -hmm. but I don't think it's a secure way to store value. Mm. That's the key, and it's purely because of proof of work. Yeah, I mean, nobody nobody even talks about Ethereum as a store of value, right? It's only it's Bitcoin that's that, talked yeah. about. So let me ask you this. In the Ethereum network, I'm assuming, um, uh, what's his name? Uh, the creator, 
I know exactly what you're talking about. I'm not good with names. <laughs> um, Vitalik Buterin, is that it? Oh, man. Uh, I, I, I butchered with a his name. Anyway, that dude. Yeah. So as a main stakeholder in the Ethereum network, does he process all the transactions? Um, you know, I can't actually say how practically and technologically the transactions are processed, but he has the largest quantity of Ethereum. Right. Right. And the largest stakeholders are the ones that process who, who, the transactions. Well, I don't know if they process it, but they have the say at least. They, so they have they to like change. They something. have to like press a button, right? Let's say, argumentally, say they've got to acknowledge everyone that changes. Oh. Maybe I don't understand enough about Ethereum to actually tell you yeah. what changes between, let's say, how many Ethereum coins you have. But they've they've got some sort of say. Mm -hmm. let's, yeah, for example, say let's say they they are the ones who mine it. Well, their Ethereum is the one who mines it, mm -hmm. and maybe their Ethereum is tied to certain mm -hmm. rules. Mm -hmm. So he'll like have a. Uh, your your code that now says these are the rules. I see what you're saying. And if he changes the code, he's got the most Ethereum, so he kind of has the most impact and right. say. Huh. I guess that's how it could work. Huh. Um, but honestly, I speak on a correction. I, I can't tell you. Exactly. We're just talking, buddy. Like, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. this is like new stuff, right? You know, we're on the cutting edge. Like, uh, people obviously know more than us. But Ethereum um, is horribly confusing. But it is. It's much, much simpler. It is. It much, is. much, much simpler. Yeah, it is. Yeah. I love, you know, I love proof of work, even though I, I'm still trying to figure out the genius of it is because of the economic energy analogy and um, and and sailors understanding of, of Bitcoin as as digital energy. Why I love it is because, you know, as a as a physicist, you'll know there's a certain amount of energy in the world cannot be added to and it cannot be subtracted to. Mm. It's just it's the, the first law of thermodynamics. Exactly. Yeah. All right. So I love that because I never realized that money needed to be the same. Hard money needs to be money that you can add to and you can't subtract from. Yeah, exactly. I don't know why that is. Have you ever read uh, the Bitcoin standard? I have. Have you? Yes. That, that one also made, it was great. I really, really enjoyed that. Me too. And the idea of of how hard money must be hard. You must not be able to add shells to the pile of yeah, shells right, and right. you must not or be able to do this stuff. It um, collapses everything. Yeah, it, it, it just makes a lot of sense. Yeah, like the sailor said, like when the uh, when the Spanish went over and, and conquered um, the Americas and took all the gold back, they inflated the gold <laughs> supply back in Spain and just caused huge economic problems. Mm. So I, I, I don't know why that is. I don't know why money needs to be hard like energy that you can't add and you can't subtract to it. I don't know why that is. And Sailor always uses these energetic systems, like, you know, like... Um, can, can I can I, sure. can I talk about it in a dumb way? Yeah. Maybe you do get this. Maybe maybe this is a key you're missing. Uh -huh. I mean, I'm just going to go out there mm -hmm. on a limb. Uh, how much do you remember about ratios back in school? I, I mean, I don't know. <laughs> like, like if we get a pizza here, right? There are eight pizzas of pizza. Uh -huh. If we share it, you got four, I got four. Right. The ratio is a half to me and a half to you. Right. Let's pretend that there's only one pizza in the world. At least that's what you believe. Right. Your pizza's kind of got value, right? Right. Um, and if I suddenly bring in another, now there are 16 pieces of pizza. Your half of all of the value that that pizza is is mm -hmm. now just been halved again into right. a quarter. Right. 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 Is that do you, you get that? I, think. I get that part okay, of it. Cool. Yeah. I mean, I can see it. I can see the reality of when you add it's more just, units. It's just, degrading it's just rotting it's just it's, rotting away i mean it's just so bizarre to me that that is a thing it is know? bizarre right it's it's actually it's it's really really obvious when it, it's been staring us in the face for a long time right. but it's it's kind of hard to see it's hard because people don't think about it i never thought about it really mm. before bitcoin i knew what inflation was I, I, I even went through those economic classes where they tell us you know you increase the money supply and you devalue the currency it's like okay great that's what inflation makes is sense. Yeah. yeah yeah and and it, it just and then I just live my life. And just carries on. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, it, and then I mean, we don't think about it until all of a sudden the U.S. is inflating the heck out of the dollar and it becomes like a thing that, that we all have to think about and worry about now. Mm. Something, I mean, I wish I could speak more about this, but I really can't. I don't understand it well enough. But it's, um, it's something that I wish uh, people knew more about was the pegging of the coal standard or rather the unpegging of the gold standard. Me too. Um, it's just that we we don't really know how much our money is worth at this yeah. point. It's all estimations. Yeah. I mean, we're just printing more and more and more, and we're kind of just seeing how it goes. Yeah. And um, you know, when you look, when you look at the graph of the U.S. dollar, you know, it's kind of devalued over time. That 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 graph that everybody shows. Um, that's what we we're using as a ruler mm. to measure economics around the world. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, a ruler 
where the centimeters and 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 the um the inches actually change. That's a good analogy. Yeah, which it's everything's so, just changing. So so we're not actually measuring things properly economically. Mm. If you assume that gold is standard, let's say, which is a reasonable assumption, you right. can see how that changes. How right. how the price of gold increases in U.S. dollar over time. Right. And if what it actually means, and it's almost like said in that way because it looks like a positive, like you bought gold, well done. Yeah. But it's more like if you flip it on the inside, it just means that if you have dollars that's just going down right. consistently right um it's, so you're escaping devaluation yeah, rather than your inflation then you're making wealth exactly right um it's uh what's have you ever seen a compound interest graph yes yeah yeah you have like so how it's compounded since the 1900s right right it's, it's a bit crazy to look at huh it's yeah that's scary stuff yeah i mean again it's like the, I love the economic energy and the digital energy analogy because what it does is it equates money with energy and it should be the same. Money and energy should not be inflated and they should not be deflated. Money should act just At like energy. At least stores of value um, in terms of money. Stores of value should not be inflated. If, if we wanted to, let's say in the Cayman, have our own currency, much like we do, mm -hmm. if you peg that to, let's say, Bitcoin, mm -hmm then you can have your own currency. You can have paper notes. You mm -hmm. can have everything. But you know that you're tied like to Bitcoin. Provably. And, and if your country suddenly goes and spends a million dollars on a new, I don't know, someone's new car, mm -hmm. <laughs> those million dollars, if they print more, you know that there's been a change. Right. You don't have the same value pegged to Bitcoin. Right. right. Um, I wish I could talk more about it. It's, it's, it's something that I just don't get enough. And I'm sure there are technical reasons for why we need to print money, why inflation must happen, because there is a reason to have inflation. Inflation is good sometimes. And for the most part, yes, but I think just the rate has been going at is just too high. So I, I don't know if I'm with you on that. I don't know if I believe inflation is good sometimes mm -hmm. anymore. I, I, I don't know enough to even argue my point, but so far from all the smart people in the world, it just seems like it has a place to play, which I can maybe understand, but mm -hmm. I do believe it's just too high. Yeah. I might, my belief is very, very much on unsturdy ground. If you, if you come with, to me with a convincing argument, I shall change my view. Yeah, same here, man. Yeah. Like I, We weren't always into Bitcoin. We changed our minds. You know, I, yeah. I heard Bitcoin back in 2010. You know, so it took a while. Uh, I watched, um, what's his name, who wrote the Bitcoin standard? I remember watching um, um, one, uh, some podcasts with him, like me, I was trying to get Bitcoin, trying to understand it, but I hadn't fell down the, the rabbit hole yet. Mm -hmm. Listened to a bunch of his podcasts, but I didn't, I hadn't fall down. Um, you know, I didn't swallow the pill, the orange pill yet at that point. So I must say, I don't know at what point I actually became quite convinced of it. Do you yeah. know? Wait, what, what was your yeah, point? Yeah. Uh, for me, it was when FTX crashed. So, um, and that was 2022, November. Um, so I'll be two years into my Bitcoin journey, um, mm -hmm. even though I heard about it, obviously, years before that. Um, but it was, and then I found Sailor um, because I, just, I was like, what is this? What is crypto? Yeah. I don't, I hate that I didn't understand what was happening with FTX. So it's, I, actually, I just, it's a good driver. Almost. Yeah, it yeah. was. I, I know a lot of people lost a lot of money. It was beneficial for me because it got me interested in Bitcoin. But, and then I found Sailor. And when Sailor made the analogy with energy, that was it for me. <laughs> it just made sense. So that was it. Yeah. And then, he, you know, yeah. he, he, he talks about like, you know, energetic systems or even, you know, the body is a system. If you, if you, you know, you take the blood out of it, you know, you're inflating the currency. It's the same thing as, you know, taking blood out of the system. I was like, oh, that makes perfect sense. And of course, it, it brought to mind all my economic classes of the past. And then I realized, like, why are we inflating the currency? It's, it's, it became the ultimate sin. Mm. You know, it's it's something, and I'm I'm always very careful with myself when talking about a new subject like this. I mean, right now we're joining a group of like-minded people who enjoy Bitcoin, who know kind of what it's about, and really think it's really good. Mm -hmm. But I haven't seen the other side of the fence. I I'm like waiting for some really smart person mm -hmm. to to stand up and say logically this works better. Let's say fiat, for example, because of these reasons. Uh -huh. I'm I'm actively trying to look for something like that, and and even though it may exist, I only know if I look for it. I'm like I'm trying to, I'm trying to think to myself: Is there something I'm missing here? This almost seems too good to be true, mm -hmm. which is kind of what I'm getting at here. Bitcoin seems a bit too good to be true. Well, a lot of people have said that. Yeah. Yeah. But it, it a, just seems to work. A lot of people who don't use Bitcoin have said that. Mm. I think Ray Dalio said that about Bitcoin. I mean, if you, if you look at it, it's like it skyrocketed. Surely this is a, a Ponzi scheme. How could it not be a Ponzi right, scheme? Right, right, right. Uh, yeah. 
and 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 the government's going to stop it and you know it's funny like you're saying to get the opposite side it's true i found I can, i'm not going to remember the guy's name but he's a, a prominent writer and he was on he was all in the bitcoin space a couple of um maybe like a month or so ago because he he had this video where he released on twitter mm -hmm. where basically he's saying the reason bitcoin is not good is because it promotes us to not trust you saw him uh, what's his name no i uh, did i i, uh, think, I think he is. wrote We'll have to Google him. Um, he, he's a popular author. Oh, yeah. I've even read some of his books. Huh. Um, um, but he said he had this video where, you know, he's like, and I thought, I thought, yeah, okay, you know what? That's actually true. That's a point. Yeah, that is we're, a point. we're not trusting. I'm we not trusting you. You're <laughs> yeah. not trusting me. Right. But I mean, we're not trusting the banks. We're not yeah. trusting the governments. And for him, that's he was saying thing. that's that was the bad thing about Bitcoin. And I was like, you're not lying. <laughs> you know, and that's a yeah. good point. He's telling the truth, but he's he's painting it in a negative way. Right. And and in a way, yes, I want to trust people. I want to trust you. I want to trust that I can come in here. You don't stab me. Like yeah. that's that's a bit of a, a trust thing, right. right? But why trust someone with money? This, this, why, why put that kind of power into somebody else's hands? That, yeah. that kind of thing is worthwhile just to keep trust. And you know what's funny about that author is that when he released that video, I thought to myself, um, um, he, is, he is not believing what he's saying mm. and he's winking at us. <laughs> no, serious. That's what I thought. <laughs> really? Yeah. I thought to myself, He's saying something he doesn't believe, but he's also saying the truth. But he's also telling you the truth. So he's also like the winking at the Bitcoin. Is like, it. Right. And I know, um, I can't remember what I was reading, but s some authors do that. Like that's a thing that they'll do because they find themselves in a, you know, a distribution channel which requires um, a specific way to believe. This is this is how we believe things. Yeah, so yeah. you, as an author for our distribution channel, you need to say these things. Otherwise, we're, you're out. Otherwise, you're Cheers. out. So what those authors tend to do <laughs> is they give them the distributor what they want, but they try and write subtextually to their real writer to their real readers saying what they really believe. And I thought, ah, oh, that's interesting. That I guess is if you were a interesting writer, interesting viewpoint. Yeah, then I think you might be right. Right, and I thought that that's what this guy. Um, I mean, it's, it's borderline, borderline tinfoil hat talk we're doing here, but it, it could work. I mean, it could be true. I, Man, I can't find this guy right now. It's just bothering me. I mean, he's just, he's a well-known... Um, I'll tell you what else um, Bitcoin's gotten me into. It's really made me very, very cognizant about our internet privacy as well. It's something that I never really thought about. And now it's just everything I do is like, oh, well, somebody's recording this step and somebody's recording that I looked for that. Yes, so yes. It's kind of... Not comforting. It that's the thing with Bitcoin. It does open you up to a lot of other things, lot which other makes things. me seem like a crazy person. So I try hold myself back as much as possible. I think the tide is shifting. You know, I think, I think there was. Uh, all I'm doing is hearing this chair ever since you brought it up. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> but um, I, I think now I think, I think there's just so many people talking good things about Bitcoin. You know, you got Jamie Dimon. You got BlackRock. I was actually going to mention Larry him Fink. as well. Yeah, he's really taken a 180 to it. it right. Seems. You know, Sailor's been at it for four years. Um, I don't know if Trump counts. He seems, Trump's coming. He seems like a bit of a rocket who or knows? a seesaw. You know. Who knows whether he counts or not, right? But he's on the bandwagon. Just for now. Right. And so I feel like I feel like the crazy era might be coming to an end. I mean, you have ETFs now. You have pensions buying Bitcoin. You know, it's like there are a lot of people that are taking steps in this direction that wouldn't be if this was a Ponzi scheme. Right. So right. it's 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 kind of reinforcing. But I get it. It's still we still come off as a cult. People tell me all the it time. It really does. It, I mean, I feel like every time I go to this Bitcoin meetup, I'm like, oh, I'll join a cult. I don't know what am I doing? <laughs> yeah, it's true. Um, I I just don't care. Yeah, I just don't care what people think though. <laughs> it's like you don't get it. Like mm -hmm. I don't know what to tell you. Like, sure, you think I'm in a cult? Great. What can you tell me about Bitcoin? Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. It's a Ponzi, really. Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah, great. You know, not not that we know or I know that much, but um we we've obviously studied it a bit. So yeah. um let's Spend jump into let, let's jump into the mempools then. Because yeah, yeah, go for it. Yeah. I haven't spent a lot of time in the mempools. Um from what I understand, the mempools are created by the miners. Uh I th no, I, no, no. I, I disagree. Yeah, I think they, it's the nose. 
The nodes create the mempools, but the miners share the mempools. Yeah, so as far as I know, you've got this massive network, right? You've got nodes all over the world that are holding potentially different transactions. Mm -hmm. In the ideal world, every no node will have the exact same mempool. Okay. Um, the transactions in the mempool have priority associated to them, okay. depending on a few factors, such as at what time that, tr that transaction was sent, mm -hmm. what fees associated with that transaction, mm -hmm. um, and I think there's another one, but I do not remember mm -hmm. Anyway, so there are a couple of things that determine like how, how far you are in the queue for the next block. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like thinking about a long waiting line at a ride, mm -hmm. and they can only take a thousand people each time. Right. So right. Like, if you're next in the line, you're going to go into the next block. Right. But somebody can pay a high, higher fee and, and get in front, and of, get in front you. of you, right. right? And then kick you out right. in your next block. That's a nice analogy of how it works. Um, and the mempool, I believe, is maintained by nodes all over the world, but they can have potentially different transactions. And this is kind of a key over here is that malicious nodes can also house malicious transactions. And you, you can purposely, everything's open source, right? So mm -hmm. you can like code a node just to work on bad transactions. You can code a node to, to push in bad uh, transactions like double spends and coins don't exist into right. the network. Right. And the only way that that doesn't work is if the miners disregard it. They kick out the transaction then because that doesn't work. Hmm. So the key here is that if you have a large enough, and this is what the 51% attack is about, right? Mm -hmm. If you have a large enough processing power and people that are on your side to push through a transaction that may not be legitimate, right. that gets onto the longest blockchain. You right. now overcome all of the legitimate people that are just actually following the rules, right. um, but it requires you to have 51% of the power mm -hmm. in the, the network, mm -hmm. be it nodes or miners. To make that happen. Yeah, you have to. Sorry, I, 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 so I somewhat muddled mum, mum, that. Um, miners can push it through. But if the, if the nodes don't agree, the nodes won't accept it. And for the miners, that's a horrible thing because that means that another miner is going to get the next longest block. Right. And even though the miner who had the malicious block now right. has gotten his coins, his coins aren't in the longest network. Right. So they aren't So now they're not usable. Huh. It works quite nicely. Right. So, so each node keeps its own mempool. I think it's usually around two, three, four hundred megs large. Okay. And that's now every transaction that's waiting to happen. You've got weird transactions in there that I'm pretty sure somebody put in 10 years ago, put a zero fee, and he's just sitting there waiting for the <laughs> coins to go through. They're just stuck in limbo. That uh, can happen, but I think there are ways to get around it nowadays. Yeah, I remember last year when they were spamming the Bitcoin network with ordinals. Um, I have no idea what an ordinal is. Can you tell me? Um, what can I tell you about that? I feel like the ordinals was like a flash in the pan. It came and now it, now it's left. It's not a thing. Um, from what I understood, it's some type of information mm -hmm. that's um, that they can put onto blocks. So it's not just a transaction. It's like a, a text message as well. A text on the message, block? yes, something like that. Okay. That 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 contains data. And so it contains information, and so it takes up block yeah, space. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so when they when they um, throw ordinals at each block, the blocks get heavier and it gets congested um, with not just transactions, but also with the ordinals. Random it, stuff that's not necessarily important to correct. the transactions. Correct, and it increased the, the fees. Ordinals. And, okay. and then um, at that point when that was all happening, I sent a small transaction to my nephew, and it took like a month to go through. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And... Um, but, you know, that was last year, and I'm not really hearing much about ordinals anymore, but it was... I mean, that's, that's, I think, the basis of how Ethereum works. They kind of work on that being the case. It's not just an Ethereum transaction. It's an Ethereum transaction with an additional bunch of code or text and mm -hmm. stuff on the back of it, which is how things run. Right. That's at least my understanding of it. So, yeah, you can do it in the Bitcoin blockchain, but it is by no means optimized to do that. It's, right. That is real bloating. It's right. just not good. And like right. you say, fees will go up. Stuff gets congested. It's not ideal. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, back to the mempool. Mm -hmm. Really, really cool. And it gives you a nice conceptualization of how it happens. Right. So in the perfect world, again, uh, your blocks would be 100% full, optimized uh, to, to just be optimized, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. That means every block you add is the exact same size. You've got the same amount, not necessarily the same amount of transactions, but more or less the same amount of trans more or less same amount of transactions. Um, but in the real world, it doesn't happen. Miners can find blocks seconds apart if they're lucky because the mining process is all just, it's kind of a gamble, right? The mm -hmm. process of finding the in, inons, the nonce, I think it's actually right. called, right? Correct. Um, they can find that in the very next hash the computer does if 
it does happen, then they've got two two blocks to send out. Mm-hmm. So suddenly the network, or the miner rather, goes, oh, well, I've got two blocks to fall. Or rather, it's put one in mm-hmm. and it's busy like getting the next lot ready. And mm-hmm. Oh, I've got a block. And it just shoves in as much as possible mm-hmm. and then releases it as soon as possible. Because every split second you wait not releasing your block, somebody else could find one before you right. and you lose it. And you right. lost the processing power you now right. Um It's actually an additional form of uh, an attack which is much, much less likely and it's, it's not probable, where if a miner has a computer strong enough and he keeps it hidden, let's say like a computer, quantum computer. Right. I don't even know where quantum computers fit into this Bitcoin blockchain. Right. I'm still figuring that out. I know. But if I don't can, think anyone knows. If he can find, let's say, five blocks in a row, uh-huh. like from a certain point, uh-huh. if he can uh, do, let's say, uh, I'm going to point on the table, sorry mm-hmm. to all the viewers. Mm-hmm. If he is, this is the chain over here now, mm-hmm. the chain stops here, he starts mining from this point, but one or two new blocks are made, mm-hmm. and he's now finding a new chain. He hasn't released it yet to the nodes. Mm-hmm. If you spend some money over here, mm-hmm. let's say you go to a coffee shop and you buy a coffee, mm-hmm. and you spend actual Bitcoin to do it, not layer two. Mm-hmm. Um, if you spend it here, and it's then minted into the next block, mm-hmm. that transaction settled, mm-hmm. done. Okay, cool, everyone's happy. If this guy suddenly releases his blocks, mm-hmm. he's now got the longest chain. And all the nodes go, oh, okay. That's the chain. Go to the longer one. Right. And now he's now effectively reversed the coffee you've mm-hmm. gotten. So now mm-hmm. if, if you've already left the coffee mm-hmm. shop, the the person you doesn't got... have, they don't have coins anymore right. because they aren't on the longest chain. Right, right. right. Um, and the way to avoid this is the standard six block waiting time. That's okay. what that is. That's just a statistical estimate of if your transaction has been in the block for six confirmations, it is almost impossible for somebody else to now have an additional chain going uh, and override you. And so what is this six block thing? What is, what is that? This? Um, it's just a, uh, a recommended amount of confirmations before you yourself declare the transaction finalized. As the miner, you mean? As a person. So if you send me Bitcoin uh-huh. and it... Uh, Bang, it's mine. Okay, cool. Yeah. I shouldn't actually give you whatever I'm going to give you for that transaction until six confirmations occur. I occurred. see. That's I the see. idea. And does those six confirmations mean six more blocks? Six more blocks following after it. Yeah. All right, so that's an hour. Uh, uh, potentially an hour. Yeah. Could be longer, could be less. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it, it, the Bitcoin network, if you're using it actually properly, is not really fast. fast it's, not, yeah. it's not efficient, it's, but it's, it's good. It's, it's rigorous. Just, boom, it's exactly boom, how it works. It is the boom. foundation that we can actually do stuff on. Do you, does Bitcoin seem like a, a clock to you? Uh, who was talking to me about this? I think it was David the other night. Was uh, he? Yeah, yeah. He okay. was telling me about how the the idea is right now. We measure time in a celestial kind of on a celestial basis with the calendar and the clocks and whatnot. And it's weird because we have three hundred sixty five point two five days. Right, like, right. It's a bit of an overlap. We have right. leap year, and it's not great. Right. And he mentioned the idea that you could actually determine a reasonably accurate time frame with the uh blockchain called, yeah what are they called the four-year cycles they're called havings e- yeah havings yeah. but equinoxes they call it ep- epilogues or no. um uh, a word. uh yeah there is a word uh, it, uh i heard someone say it the other day it's called an epoch so we know what we're yeah, talking it, about it's yeah. an epoch yeah sorry you're right epoch. Okay. it's an epoch um and it, essentially the amount of time that differs between the epochs right now is super close just because of the law of averages. Right. Right now, every uh, on average, the difficult with the difficulty adjustment and the addition and subtraction of miners and everything that's going on, on average, it works out super well right. to actually keep time. Right. Personally, I, I don't see enough information for it to beat an atomic clock or something like that, but it it, it does work reasonably well, at mm-hmm. least for not practical use day to day. Well, I think when the ordinals were happening and I heard people talking about the ordinals. That could definitely cause a problem. Well, I, I thought that that's when it um, it being a clock became apparent to me because I realized then that what you could do is you can stamp maybe even just a web page. Oh, sorry. Is that what you mean? So like you've now got something in the immutable blockchain. You've said this thing it's at this point at in this time. At this point in time. Oh, exactly. Yeah, 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 I mean, definitely. what Satoshi did on the very first block, right? Mm-hmm. Um, what did you write? Chancellor approves new bailout. You Something know, like that, yeah, yeah. I actually don't know. Yeah. Um, and so when that was happening, the ordinals were happening, and then people were talking about it, I'm like, oh, okay, I see it being a sort of proof that something did happen at this time in the blockchain. We can mm. go back in time and see when that blockchain was, and we know that it happened because it was stamped on the blockchain. 
And um, I think ever since then, I've just... It's a good use case. Yeah, I've just like, ha, that's that's interesting to me because I'm very influenced. I always bring up this book, um, The Philosophy of Photography, and and Wilhelm Flusser is the uh, philosopher who wrote it. But he he was very concerned with photographs and the world that we were entering because he thought that we were moving to an ahistorical um, time frame when humanity is going to be just inundated with all these photos and we're not going to know what's like real and not and exactly that is a very cool idea that right. i've never thought about and i was scrolling on instagram the other day and there was like a 911 um thing and of course t- uh, you know underneath the comments it was like oh look it's fake it's fake it's fake you know whatever whatever and i remember thinking i'm like wow okay we're we're 20 years removed or however long from 911 when we're 100 years removed from 911 and people are looking at this footage they're not really going to know whether that happened it's or not. It's definitely not, not going to be as obvious. Yeah. It's not going to be as obvious, right? And then I'm like, ah, so this is how the blockchain can can actually help. Mm. It the, can the, the line blockchain up. chain technology, definitely. I don't think Bitcoin, though. No? no? Yeah, no, no. You, don't, think, you don't want ordinals flooding no, no, that no, network no, at all? No, no, <laughs> no. Let's just keep it about money. Let's uh-huh. do that. I mean, sure, it's worthwhile to sometimes have some techs in these things. There right. may be a reason for it. Right. But the technology of blockchain... right. By far better. Frankly, develop a blockchain that gives a block every second then and, and doesn't necessarily use proof of work because, okay, you can maybe argue with me about this, but mm. you, in this scenario where you want to, like, let's say, timestamp images, documents, voice notes, whatever the case may be, right. it's not necessarily worthwhile to tie that to energy. Uh-huh. depending on how important you think it is. Maybe they're really important documents you want to have tied to a proof of work, but then maybe others must be like a proof of stake kind of thing. I, I don't know. Um, but that could be much, much better optimized for storing data for the whole world. Yeah. Bitcoin blockchain definitely can't do that. That is not designed to do that. It should not do that at all. I like to think it can scale. I like to think in the future it will scale. I mean, it could. It definitely could. But the I think it's it's important that we keep it on its current at least objective of what it's meant to achieve. If we right. start start trying to do too many things, right, right. it just undermines the actual purpose of right, it. Right, right. And I think you're completely right. Blockchain technology, great for that. Right. Because everyone can verify it. Right. Um, but I don't think Bitcoin is the answer for that. Mm, yeah. mm. So we veered off from mempool. Um, yeah, yeah. No. But I mean, yeah. So um, you know what's interesting about this conversation is that you and I are both, I think, pretty new. Very new. To, to Bitcoin. But probably a lot of the things that we're talking about, and sure, a lot of it is speculation, but a lot of it, people out there who are new to Bitcoin, who don't understand Bitcoin, are not going to know what the heck we're talking about. Completely true. And I forget sometimes that something that seems obvious to us now, something like hash rates, transactions, it blocks, right. all these things. Difficulty adjustment. Exactly. Havings, yeah. proof of work. We just, we're just we're just not talking about it now. Right. Meanwhile, somebody goes, well, "What the hell is that?" And so I, I wonder, how do you approach it then when you're trying to talk to um, somebody who doesn't know? Yeah, um, I am actually currently going through that process in my mind. I'm trying to think, okay, what 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 did I see as a, I assume, region, reasonably logical person, to actually get to the conclusion of where I am now? Mm-hmm. So I've tried to like think back, okay, from where I started. What mm-hmm. what actually happened? What got me on this path? Mm-hmm. And I'm trying to find a way to just say facts without um, throwing shade at fiat. Right. Um, I don't think that the learning of Bitcoin should come at the cost of something else. I think it should be learning because of what this thing is capable to do. Right. So I'm trying to find a way to at least explain the fundamental ideas of it. Mm -hmm. Because I think I've managed to figure out so far that, and I mean, I could be wrong again, but Bitcoin runs on a few core technologies such as blockchain, Mm -hmm. consensus, Mm -hmm. and there was a third one that I can't remember. Blockchain, uh, proof of work, I think. Mm -hmm. I think those are like my top three fundamental technologies which Mm -hmm. are different but combined make the Bitcoin network, Mm -hmm. which if you understand each of those separately, you kind of understand the backbone of what Mm -hmm. keeps the thing Mm -hmm. running. And it's often easy to hop between all of them because they're all tied together. Mm -hmm. But at least in my own mind, I like talking about them separately. Mm -hmm. So So you you try and explain people, 
about the Bitcoin network and how it works. Is that, is I, that how you do it? Rather I, than yeah. talking about, yeah, inflation's the worst, you know, the central banks are the worst. I try and not do that because right. when I do that, I think it shuts people out. Yeah. They're like, oh, fuck, another one of you guys. Just, just get out of here. I don't yeah. want to listen to you. Yeah, it's yeah, just yeah, like yeah. doomsday. Everything. Guy. And and I don't want to be like that either. Yeah. I, I'm terrified of the possibility of that happening, but I... I Let's not do it for that reason. Let's do it for the reason that this is an awesome technology mm -hmm. that can solve a lot of problems. Mm -hmm. Maybe Bitcoin isn't the answer to what we're looking for, but it damn well can solve some problems mm -hmm. for us. Mm -hmm. So I think my, my idea right now is to um, talk about, uh, I hate to use the word decentralization, but I guess it's to talk about that. Why, right. why, why go through all of this when there's a better way to do it? Right. Um, I'm not sure yet. I'm still making up my mind. I know. I, I don't think there's no answer, right? I feel like mm. I feel like everybody comes to Bitcoin in their own way and for their own reasons. There's a curiosity that's different with everyone. Yeah. I mean, the, so there's the main thing that got me was just like, why the hell? What's a gold currency? Why aren't we pegged to it anymore? Right. That, that got me started. Right. And if like the energy thing was yours, right? Yeah, I think everyone has their own means, and in a way, I guess this is actually the best thing for Bitcoin is if you can slowly but surely chat to every single person in the world and, and kind of get them curious on what they're interested. Right. That just leads to everything. Right. And Bitcoin mustn't be suddenly adopted by the world tomorrow because we don't have any more sats to buy. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but it, it needs to just happen slowly. It needs to happen very, very naturally. Right. That's all that can happen. And it has been happening. Mm. Um, do you watch Fred Krueger on YouTube? No, I'm afraid not who, at all. So who are your YouTube guys? Who who are your or like main um, or do you not have? Or you I, just kinda... I used to like YouTube a lot, but I have a very addictive personality. Yeah. I find so yeah. I've like uninstalled as much as I can from my phone. I try not to use it. The only time I ever use something like YouTube is just for entertainment. I I, I try okay. not to go too far okay. into detail. Naturally, if you're researching stuff, things come up and you you, know, you kind you of have to it. do this now. Yeah, yeah. But I haven't. I don't. I try not to like subscribe to people that are doing informative things. Mm -hmm. I know I'm missing out a lot, mm -hmm. but for me right now, I like trying to keep my time, my mm -hmm. own, for as much as I can. Sure. I've got my timers and everything yeah. on my phone. I really try and just keep it down. Sure, so sure. Could, what can you tell me about what Fred Kruger? Oh, uh, well, what were we talking about? I guess we were talking about adoption and, and, and Kruger, he's all about the power law. Right, ah, and yeah, using yeah, the power yeah. law. I was on Chat GPT. Explain the power law to me. Why is it important? What's it do? Nah, nah, nah. Um, and so he he just he tracks Bitcoin price and and adoption and um, something else. And both um, show um, exponential growth mm. when you examine it from a power law perspective. So when you're looking at it on a log graph, it kind of goes. Exactly. Yeah, so you'll know what a log graph is better yeah. than better than me, right? Oh, we use it all the time. This in the and why do math. you use log graphs? What's the... Oh, what's it's just the engineering. So it much is actually the exact reason you're talking about is in, in nature, things act according to power laws more than they do according to linear laws. Okay. So linear will be like a straight line, right? Mm -hmm. uh, a linear thing will be like... Hmm, I'm trying to think of... An, even, even now, I can't really think of a natural scenario of linear. Everything's either parabolic or exponential. Um, a ball falling in gravity that accelerates slowly as it goes down, right? Right, it's an exponential fall. It's an exponential Interesting. fall. If you look at that in a log graph, uh -huh. it's actually a straight line. Right. And that's the key because right. there's a lot of information inside uh, exponential things that you don't see when you look at a graph in a linear, linear. perspective. Right. That's, that's just a, a mathematics engineering thing that we've found in scientific thing. Right. It's just much, much more beneficial like that. Um and it, it applies to uh, finance as well. Yeah. When you think about money and how it's changed over time, it, you, can, you, can, you can infer a lot more about what's happened when you look at how much something has changed, not according to the narrow time frame you look at now. Oh, it went up 90% in a year. It's more like, okay, well, if you look at it back from the start, this was a very, very small spike compared right. to what it's done. Right. And it's got its pros and, and advantages and disadvantages, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, because he was saying, you know, when you look at Bitcoin linearly, it looks risky. Super risky. Right. If you look at Bitcoin like now, it's like this is not look like a wise investment. If right. you've got money to blow, put it in. Right. But, but when you when you chart it logarithmically or whatever the word is, mm. it's a straight line. It's just it's a straight just line going up. up. Yeah, you know, and it has well, like the well, upper not, edge not and even, the bottom edge. Not even straight line. Sorry, I'm just going to correct you. It's kind of like a, a parabolic. You're right. Slowly That's evening correct. out. Yeah, kind yeah. Of thing. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, um, and so yeah, so he's just big on that. And and I, I never thought about the adoption, like the the amount of wallets that are increasing. That's also following a power law. Um, How does he and determine like, that? Huh. That's a, it's, it's interesting. Well, all aren't can all wallets be um, 
viewed on the blockchain? They can all be viewed, but yeah. there are, an, I want to say, infinite amounts of wallets. There, there aren't. There is a finite, but the amount of wallets is close to infinity. So I wonder, I guess the only way no, he can view that. How can it be close to infinity? The amount of wallets? Yeah, but think Why? about it. How, how long is a, is, a, is a public address? How many characters is a public address? I don't know. A lot. A lot. Like yeah. A crap load. Um, do you know how many combinations there are of a pack of 52 poker cards? No. A lot. A lot. Okay. There are more combinations of, of but a But you're pack. talking about potential wallets. Yes, Those potential are infinite. wallets. I yes. agree. Yeah. Oh, but, sorry. Are you talking about current wallets? He's yeah. talking about like wallets that people actually set up. I guess the buy, only way to, to really coin. know is just to see where transactions go. But that's, right. a lot of, that's a lot of data. Yeah, I'm sure it is because each person can have multiple wallets, right? Mm. Um, but that's what he's talking about. Yeah, I'm not talking about just the amount of wallets that could oh, potentially yeah. be. It's yeah. incredible. It's like it's yeah. out there. Yeah, um, but he's talking about the, the, the wallets that have recently come online. Okay. And then throughout the years, that's also been growing exponentially. And does like, he have the statistics on, online? I'm sure he does. He's a math guy. Um, so PhD. Yeah, I'm going to ask you the name again before I write, yeah, write yeah. it down and check it up when I get home. Yeah, he just released a book. Um, the big Bitcoin book. It's like a coffee, <laughs> it's a coffee table book. <laughs> That's cool. With lots of images, but it's already sold out like in 13 hours or something oh, like that. Um, he's kind of like this older guy. You know, Bitcoiners tend to be younger. Mm, definitely. But he's um, older. And um, so I like following him um, because he just, he's, um, it's just, he's just, he's just kind of an interesting guy to, to watch. Um, he's not like, Young and energetic and gung ho. He's just like oh, yeah, he's, he's well, kind of he's this is seen. Bitcoin. He kind of talks like this, <laughs> <laughs> um, but super. You know, it's it's good to watch his perspective. It's a different perspective. Than it is, typical yeah. It's very Bitcoiner. much. I mean, I completely agree with you from a from a young person's perspective. I guess we would be considered. I guess according to him, at least, it's a very very uh, uh, specific type of orientation. We've got most of our lives still ahead of us, but from him looking backwards, it's it's good to see that kind of thing as yeah. well. Yeah, yeah. Huh. Yeah, definitely. So what else can we say about Bitcoin? How long have we been going here? Uh, I've Hour just, and a half. Wow, I've just been talking nonstop. Hey, man, <laughs> it, you know, this is what um, Bitcoin's about. This is what this podcast's about, yeah. you know, talking and, and learning and, and growing. What is something about Bitcoin that you don't, that you wish you knew more about? Like if I could f click my finger and suddenly know more. Right. Hmm. Off the top of my tongue, I can't really think of it. There's, there's so many more things I want to know. Mm -hmm. um, if I if I could transfer that to Ethereum, I'd like to do that. Right. <laughs> I'd like to just suddenly know how that well, works. Well, I think that's an important part of the Bitcoin journey too, is understanding Ethereum, understanding the other crypto networks. It's definitely it's important to understand, I'm going to say, the competition. You've right. got to know what else is out there. Right. Even, even if Bitcoin is the best thing ever, it's... it's uh, not a wise thing to only lock yourself into no one sure. thing. I believe it's very important to know as much as you can, right. as much as you reasonably can. Right. So, I mean, if I could do that, I'd, I'd love to know, like something like Monero. Do you know right. about Monero? A little bit. I've been hearing it. Just Monero like everybody sounds else. like a really, really cool uh, Is that idea. the one that does tons of transactions? Well, it's, 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 um, it's a blockchain, but it's also not public. And I, I cannot tell you how it works, but mm. it's great for privacy. It's, mm. it's, um, it's really good. All oh, right, that was the thing with Monero. It's great for privacy, right? Mm. So that's kind of how it beats Bitcoin, because Bitcoin's not as private. If you can, and I actually spoke to Pete about this a few weeks ago, if you can actually make an atomic swap from Bitcoin to Monero, and then wait a while, and then go from Monero back to Bitcoin, there is no practical way. I don't think there's any possible way for you to tell that you received and you sent that same Bitcoin. There's Is just, that just, right? You can't do it. So what's that called again when you clean your Bitcoin? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I just what's hear the people term talking about it in the, the gangster time. world? It's it's your uh, uh, laundering. laundering. You know, you're laundering your money. <laughs> right, right. Uh, it kind of is that. Um, so can you do that with Bitcoin and Monero? Or you can't wrap it yet. Right now, um, it's not even wrapping. It's it's. Do you know about atomic swaps? No. Tell me about atomic swaps. Okay, just briefly. So from I my, love that it has the word atomic in it. I love it as well, yeah. and it's really really an apt name. Atomic yeah. swaps is called atomic swaps because it only has a positive or negative outcome. It either it works or it doesn't. There is no in between. Okay. Um, having something that's wrapped means you've like locked it here, mm -hmm. and then you 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 can't use it here. But on the other chain, you can start using that thing's like unlocked almost. That's mm -hmm. that's like a wrapping, I assume. Okay. An atomic swap um, is a simultaneous transaction 
So I think what will happen is on the Bitcoin network, your Bitcoin that you want to atomic swap just goes to some other address, to mm -hmm. somebody else. Mm -hmm. And the Monero, somebody else sends that thing to your address. Mm -hmm. And now it's just it's just a, you have a Bitcoin, no Monero, and then bloop, Monero, no Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. That's the idea. Mm -hmm. it's, it's meant to be as simple and clean cut as that. Mm -hmm. uh, I saw on the Monero website, you can currently do an atomic swap from Bitcoin to Monero. But from Monero to Bitcoin isn't super Can. easy right okay. yet. I, there may be ways, but okay. at least it wasn't doing the normal <sighs> way. So what's the difference between that and just a regular smart contract? Is there a difference? Because um, I, watched, I watched a video today. I, I, I was under the, the assumption that smart contracts use, I'm going to say, a wrapping technique right. more. Although there are things called bridges which maybe do that as well. Huh, so I atomic say. doesn't doesn't wrap is what you're saying. Atomic isn't a wrap thing at all. No, it, once you once your um, once you've done the swap, you have not got any claim on any Bitcoin on the network. Mm. It is not yours anymore, mm. even in a wrapped form. Mm -hmm. um, I really hope that's actually how it works. That's right. how I've understood it, but I have right. not tested my theory. Right. Huh. Um, so it works. It works really, really well. And what that means is that because y you can then utilize the benefit of the Monero blockchain being completely anonymous to then move your funds back out to a different public address right. in a deterministic wallet in Bitcoin. But it says there's no, no trail to you. I mm. think I was you, you know, Pete was saying the other day that if somebody does that, there's no practical way for them to trace the funds. Right. You just can't do it. On the right. Bitcoin ledger, it's great because you can actually see where the Bitcoin goes, right? Right. You can go through coin joins and... and uh, uh, coin joins, that's the word, yeah. Yeah, oh, is that uh, what you're yeah, looking yeah. for? You can go through coin joins and, and I don't know, uh, tumbling happens in a coin join. There's another word. It's a spiral... Whirlpool. I think whirlpool, whirlpool is okay, technically yeah, a different yeah, technique. Sense. Yeah, yeah. Um, Fascinating but, stuff. But, but if, if you were important enough... And if somebody else had enough of a grudge against you, they can, with enough power and pure brute, brute force. force, figure out who you are. Right. But it's impractically difficult. It's kind of like uh, being uh, a gazelle in a herd, right? You're right. safe in a herd with everyone else. Right. If you're standing out, you can be targeted with that still, with right. a great amount of effort, but it can happen. Huh. Going through... Uh, Monero, it's, you can't even do that. Yeah, there may be ways to do it. We don't understand yet, mm -hmm. but I think it's still very, very new. So let me let me ask you this about. Let's talk about Ethereum and, and Monero. And from what I understand, these are systems, um, computer systems that allow elegant transactions to happen, um, smart contracts. Mm. What I don't understand is why coins are needed. That's a great question, which I definitely can't answer, but I can definitely talk about it. <laughs> okay, let's talk about it. Um, and, and the one thing I'll say, and the only thing I can really say about it, is that a coin is essential to kind of maintain the, I'm going to say, the value in the network. It's almost a, if you don't have incentive for someone to do something, why should they do it? It's like a, a very fundamental human question, mm, right? If, mm. if I... If I um, find somebody on the street to help uh, fix something in my house, mm -hmm. they'll either help me because I pay them mm -hmm. or because of the loveliness of their heart. Mm -hmm. And the latter doesn't normally work for, for people <laughs> who don't know yeah. or even for very long. Yeah. So there's got to be some sort of incentive, right? right? Right. And I think the easiest way to solve that incentive is through a coin. Mm. That's the most practical way because right. you tie to the system there they have an incentive to keep the network going. Everything, the everything coin has value. It's just tied together very, mm. very neatly. Mm. Um, but I do agree that when you have 50 different blockchains with 200 different coins on each one of them, it gets a bit much. Yeah. Uh, there's a bit too many. And, and I can understand in a space like this, because there's no regulation, and I don't know if there should be, but I, for now it's fine. Yeah. Um, people need to experiment. Things need to happen. And it's unfortunate that people's life savings go into these things. But the experiments need to happen. We need to see how this works and what the actual best way to do this mm -hmm. is. I don't think there's any way we're going to find it without trial and error. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I, I think coins are essential. For at just least, incentives. At least for incentives. Yeah. But I, 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 I very much am convinced that there is probably another way. I just don't know what that way is. Mm. But don't the coins also play into the proof of stake thing because the coins... Prove mm. that you have stake. Yeah, yeah, you can definitely, network. yeah, definitely. If you have a proof of stake mechanism and you need the coins as well, it's yeah. another reason to have them. Um, I'm trying to remember. Monero doesn't have 
uh, proof of stake or proof of work. There's got something, something else. else. It's, okay. it's, I, I don't know. Mm-hmm. I don't know how it works at all. Um, but, uh, at least according to Jack Miller's Mahler's Mahler's. Oh, I almost got it. Um, no one else ties to the real world like Bitcoin yeah. does at least. So they I could be different, but it's not, it's not Bitcoin. I love that it ties to the real world like that. I just, I don't know why it's like an instinctive thing that I like about it. Yeah. You know, really? when, when you, when you, when you divorce it from all that energy, I, it just becomes less interesting to me. And that's why Ethereum's, it's just not as interesting to me. Mm-hmm. I definitely want to learn more. Um, I definitely, d- I can't say, sit here and say, I know much about Ethereum and it may very well live long. But it's just not as interesting to me because it's not connected into all that energy mm, that these mm. miners need to connect to. But I mean, to. it's, it's kind of like, why do we have Facebook and why has it lasted so long? There's no real connection between us and the real world, right? right. Like we, we, we put our information on there. If right. Facebook were to disappear, sure, people would be upset and we'd probably have a big problem. But right. um, it's, it's not, it's, it's a, I want to say a superfluous thing almost. It's, it's on the outside. It's right. not part of us. It's not right. like us losing our energy grid. Right. Not the same thing. Huh. Uh, sorry, one other thing I wanted to add it. Huh. We were talking about, like, let's say, copying and pasting a document. Uh-huh. Now you've got two of them. Uh-huh. Imagine if copying and pasted that cost you $1,000 worth in, in power. You wouldn't copy and paste that so easily, yeah, right? right? That's right. almost that. Meanwhile, people would try to do that, but right. it's also like it's a gamble at the end. That's, that's almost like the Bitcoin proof of mechanism. Work right, mechanism. right, right. And, you know, it's funny because like, when you hear about proof of work, and apparently Fred Krueger knows that, I was just watching that, but he knows the... The woman who invented proof of work, it came out in a 1992 paper, but I think the reason that they invented proof of work was to stop spamming. Hmm. Right? And I think, it was e- I think it was email spamming. I feel like I've heard that before somewhere as well. Mm-hmm. Maybe it was actually in the Bitcoin standard too. And because spamming, like copying and pasting, was just too easy to do. It didn't mm. cost anything. You can set up a program. You just make it cost something. Right. Easy and, you, and you make it cost something. And that's how proof of work was invented. Yeah, I mean, fundamentally, that's still the same idea, right? It, mm. it, it's a bit more tricky when you talk about blocks and hashes mm. and, and all sorts of things. My mind goes nuts, but yeah. it's the same idea. Yeah. Don't make it super easy to do something and it won't happen as often. All right. Huh. So, um, you know, I'm sure you have things to do. So let's, let's start to wrap mm. it up. Yeah, sure. But before we do, let's talk about Germany. Oh, let's talk about Germany. Yeah, why not? <laughs> oh, I must say, I don't have very extreme views on them, but I don't understand. I mean, I guess maybe they just needed the funds. I just don't know why they did it. But that's what I thought too. But then, but then I realized that all of that Bitcoin was just Bitcoin that they seized. Mm, it wasn't, they didn't buy it or anything. They, yeah, they, they didn't buy it. It, it was an right? asset so to them. It, you know, I, I get that they need cash flows, sure. But why is that all of it? Oh, man. Did you see the website that the guy built? Uh, they post on, on the, the, the chat this yeah, morning. Exactly. Right? Yeah, exactly. Pretty yeah. cool, yeah. yeah. <laughs> what, what if they didn't sell.com or whatever? Uh, I think when I saw it, it was least worth, I don't know, $100 million more? Yeah. I think it was like $400 million more. Before. Yeah. Well, like, I mean, <sighs> that's going to be a very interesting website. It is. <laughs> to, and, to keep checking throughout time. And I must be honest, I, I never, I've never actually looked into how countries work with seizing Bitcoin at the moment. I assume most of them keep it. So either they keep it or they sell it immediately. That I, seems to be the standard. I think they sell it immediately. Normally, at least. In Cayman, they do. Yeah, in Cayman, they currently Which do. Which hurts. It does. Imagine keeping yeah. that stuff. Like, why are you selling great. Bitcoin? It's like, oh... And, That's just and I can understand <laughs> the reasoning behind this, but it's not the same as selling a car immediately that you see. It's, right. it's just not the same at all. Right. Um, but I, I, I am very curious as to what, why, first off, they held on to it and why they decided to sell all of it now. Yeah. Which is very interesting. Yeah, it is. I mean, it's just, it's hard to make sense of it. And and I we want to make sense of it. Like there's got to be a rational reason they needed the money. Okay, maybe that maybe that's as simple as it was. Um, but as Bitcoiners, it's just it just seems like a tragic error. Have Germany made any statements about it? I don't think so. I haven't heard a thing. And they just had the Euro Cup there. Conspiracy theory time. Um, imagine if somebody else had access to their wallet and just sold it. And Jeremy was like, <laughs> you did what? All right, all right. Uh, no, I have I no think idea. we would have heard a statement from them at that point. Perhaps. Yeah. Perhaps. Um, or the, if they would, they'd have to, if they gave that statement, they'd have to then say they weren't taking care of their wallet. Yeah. Uh, maybe it was just better for them to keep quiet. Huh, I wonder. You know, on, on one hand, you have nations actively using Bitcoin as a strategically reserve, strategic reserve asset 
Mm. And then you have Germany. I mean, who's doing that now? El Salvador. El Salvador. Technically Korea, North Korea. Are they? <laughs> well, I mean, not in the legal sense. So they're supposedly um, Darknet uh-huh. podcasts. I okay. what they're called. Have you ever listened I've to I've heard them? of it. I haven't listened to it. It's quite cool. Yeah. And it operates out of North Korea? Yeah. So, okay. so what they find is a lot of the crypto heights happening, at least within the last five, 10 years, right. most of those funds get funneled back into North Korea. Fascinating. Which is quite interesting. Yeah. And I, I think that they, they find that's very useful. Not even, I'm, I'm going to correct myself here, a lot of goes back, but a lot just gets held stationary. Huh. And when North Korea needs money somewhere, they just sell the Bitcoin there. Right. It works nicely. There you go. Bitcoin <laughs> is for everyone. It is. Okay. Even, unfortunately, either, even the, uh, I want to say terrorists. Bad actors. I mean, really you know, bad countries. Sure, but that's not a reason to not use Bitcoin. Um, you know, bad actors use cash. Bad actors use US dollar. Exactly. Bad yeah. actors use the internet. You know, bad actors use planes, bad actors use vehicles. Like, you know, it's exactly. not a thing. It's, it's not a way not, to it's judge. Not, it's not the tool. It's who uses it. Right, right. Um yeah, so you have, you know, you have El Salvador. Um, oh yeah, I'm, I'm interested to hear Trump in Nashville next week. Very curious. Because, you know, there's rumors about he's going he's gonna to announce that U.S. is using it as a strategic <laughs> reserve oh asset. Oh boy, I better try and get some more. All right, all right. I was telling somebody the other day. Where did this come from? I imagine somebody's just making them up. I think, um, who, with Trump, you mean? Yeah, like... I think Vivek, the guy Vivek Brahmaswamy. Yeah? Yeah, because he's big, he's big into Bitcoin and crypto. I remember when he was on the, you know, tour, when he was running for president before he got swallowed by Trump. If, he was talking about Bitcoin and crypto a lot. Yeah, if, if Trump makes that kind of a statement and wins, that is a massive, massive. turning point. Sure. Like, actually terrifyingly sure. massive. And I know everyone's going to be like, Trump's just saying that he's not going to do it. And it might be the case. And I actually, I, I agree. I actually, I actually 100% believe that. I don't care. <laughs> I want the words to come out of his mouth. Yeah, right now it's real yes. good publicity. Yeah. yeah. Uh, as Bitcoiners, it's like, I want to hear you talk about Bitcoin. I want you, I want to see you bend the knee <laughs> at Bitcoin, whether you use it or not. Have you ever heard of the S-Graph? Yeah, maybe. maybe it's a mathematical thing right? it is a mathematical right. thing so like any any tech, any new technology from electricity electricity to cars to aeroplanes they follow an s-graph it follows an s-graph okay. of adoption right uh-huh. so you've got like time on the x-axis uh-huh. and um, your adoption rate from zero to 100 sure. percent and the theory is i really hope i'm right here the amount of time it takes from for you to get from zero percent adoption at zero time until 10 percent adoption that time it's the same amount of time it'll take you to get to 80% adoption. Mm. So mm. the idea is when, whenever we reach that 10% adoption phase, which is tricky to know, mm-hmm. we know that it's that amount of time to get to the next to phase, the next to 80, the 80%, to 80%, which is, which is considered adopted. Right. So basically anything after that 10%. You're like on the skyrocket now, right, just doing this. Right, right. Huh. But determining when the ten percent is, is anyone's game. Is getting, anyone's guess? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I have one last question for yeah. you before we go. Not that you know, it's just a question. One that I was asking myself: Why does El Salvador not use create their own currency and their peg it crypto. to Bitcoin? That's a great question. Because right now they've decided to use the U.S. dollar, right? So mm. th- those are the two currencies in El Salvador: Bitcoin and the U.S. dollar. Obviously, the U.S. dollar is inflating 25% over the last four years. Sure, it's the best that we got. But why not? Why doesn't El Salvador just create their own currency and peg it to Bitcoin? Are there any currencies that do that currently? I, I wish f- Cayman would do that. <laughs> that would be so cool. I, I, um, I speak in a correction, but I don't know of any cryptocurrencies that are actually pegged to another and I guess the reason why is because everyone just wants to make their own billions. Why be sure. pegged to another one? Let's just see what happens. Right. Um, and I can imagine that that would be good. Sorry, a uh, follow-up question. Mm-hmm. Would that currency run in the same blockchain? Why, why can't it just be a fiat? Why can't it be just something that they print? Oh, sorry. When you say currency, you don't mean cryptocurrency. Not necessarily. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah. yeah. Fiat currency. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, yeah, why not? Everyone, everyone works with cash. Everyone knows cash. Very much, you could have Bitcoin slip into the role that gold gold played for a very, very long time in the mm-hmm. 1900s mm-hmm. Um, and early 2000s. Mm-hmm. Um, you could do that. Just but peg, I, peg it to it. But I guess the problem is that 
uh, it's kind of the same reason they left the gold standard. I don't know what that reason is. Don't ask me. <laughs> well, because they needed more money. Yeah, exactly. They needed to, yeah. Print, they needed to make they, money. They won't do that and they won't have their own currency go still. Um, I guess it's just better off overall just to start anew and use the technology we have now. Everyone's got, I mean, they're, they're more, every every person in the world, almost every person at least has a, a digital smartphone. Yeah. But most people, they don't even have a toilet. Yeah. At least in Africa. Right. Everyone's got a cell phone. It's, Crazy, huh? Yeah. It's, it's um, I guess, a much, much more widely accepted technology now and why not just embrace it completely if yeah. you're going that way and embracing bitcoin early yeah just embrace it completely you know when i ask the question now i think about it i think i think the reason that they're using u.s dollar is because of network effects and so many salvadorians live in the u.s and still so practical for it's them. still practical yeah. for them and they and the salvadorians in the u.s send money back um, to El Salvador. So I think just keeping it as the US dollar, it just made sense practically, I think. Um, but yeah, I wonder who's going to be the first country to peg a hard currency to Bitcoin. I, wonder. I, I know it's still too volatile and there's that thing. And and if I if I ran a country, right, right, <laughs> I right. like to think about this a lot. Right, right, right. I, I wouldn't <laughs> think that keeping your, your actual hard cash is very beneficial at all because there's a lot of work that goes into maintaining hard cash, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, stuff does tear, stuff breaks, cash gets lost. You have to slowly print more. You've mm -hmm. got to be really, really careful about mm -hmm. it. Otherwise, you end up in the scenario mm -hmm. where we are now. Mm -hmm. Um, but you've got to prevent anybody else from printing it. You've got to have certain security things mm -hmm. and measures in place. You've got to change the currency every now and again. Mm -hmm. you've, um, you've got to hold and just maintain it and, and protect it effectively. There's a lot of money that goes into spending protecting money, mm -hmm. I'd imagine. Mm -hmm. And why use that when you've got this great alternative when right. you're just wasting money? I, I can't imagine why they would keep it around right. besides maybe by weaning it off slowly. Yeah. Like you accept both for a while and slowly less and less and less. Right. And, you know, I Which guess. I think as Bitcoiners we expect to happen. I guess, yeah. Yeah. It's scary to think about, to be honest. Um, I, I like the the ignorant bliss of of just not knowing about this stuff, but it's too late for me now. <laughs> it's, uh, it's a little bit scary to think about. Like what? What do you mean? Ignorant bliss of not knowing what? Not knowing what's currently happening in, in fiat and right. inflation. Right. I mean, Every, I mean, everyone knows if you ask them, what's inflation doing? They just say, oh, it's going up. Yeah. Everyone knows that. Yeah. But do they know what that means? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's just increasing more and more and more. And I think, I think they just, it's like natural. I guess. You know, it's like, oh yeah, oh, yeah, yeah prices yeah, no, go up, duh. Yeah. Like hot dogs used to cost five cents. And it makes a lot of sense mm -hmm. if you are investing in something and you see, oh, price goes up. Cool. I'm happy. I'm yeah. making money. And yeah. because the, the, the dollar or the rand or whatever your currency is, is, right. is your base. Right. But when the basis it itself is what moving, what is moving, it's kind of hard to keep that relative perspective, which yeah, is what we're now actually exploring. To be completely right, honest, right? And and the inability of the U.S. dollar to measure properly, um, because like it's a bit even, changing, yeah. Because every change, like hmm. my parents' house, I think they said it was like fifteen thousand to when they first purchased it. Now probably worth four hundred, five hundred thousand. And the question is. Yeah. Did that house, which is 40 years older, uh -huh. increase in value or did the U.S. dollar decrease in value or is there a combination of both at play? We don't know. That's kind of, that's, that's the real question really. Right. Um, so it looks like a great investment. Yeah, it looks great because of the, like, whoa, whoa, money go up. Right, good. right. Um, but we know that money goes up because they print more money. Hmm. So... Is the value increasing or not? Like that's it's a good question. I yeah. wonder, and, and and I actually tried to look for something like this a little while ago. I'd love to see common things measured in gold, like the price right, of house. Right, right. Because if you can peg that to gold, which theoretically should much be much more stable, and it right. isn't Bitcoin for the now for the time being because it's so new. Right. It would be really, really useful to actually see whether the price changed that much right. in gold. Right, right. That I think there useful. there are websites for that. I think. I haven't there is a yet. website for Bitcoin, priced in Bitcoin. Oh, really? Yeah. I have not even seen and it. And guess what happens to the prices priced in Bitcoin? <laughs> they drop. Uh, yeah. I, yeah. They no. just drop exponentially. I guess it's just so amazing. Do you know Jeff Booth? Mm, I've heard of his name before. Yeah, he wrote a book as well, Price of Tomorrow. And he's a lot, on a lot of the podcasts. But one of his, his favorite lines is, um, prices drop to the marginal cost of production. Prices drop to the marginal cost of production. So in his head, the... Um, the, mm. the natural state of an economy where technology is improving is that prices drop. Yes, because so things become cheaper to do. Right. Because your technology is improving. Right, right, exactly. Mm. Um, but 
not in the economy we are, prices go up. Why is that? And and that's what Booth is saying, because well, they're printing money, that's why. It's an important point, actually, and it's a very logical sound point. Yeah. There's a nifty uh, website you just made me think of. Um, have you ever heard of it? It's called uh, What Happened in 1971. Yes. Have you seen it? Yes. That's a really cool thing. Yes. It's got the graphs, and it's, I love graphs. Yeah. Graphs. Excel, I am an Excel avid lover. Is that right? Lover. Yeah, I love okay, making okay. graphs. Anyway, huh. yeah. Yeah. All right, buddy. Sorry, um, I, I keep talking more and more and more. No, no, no. So, let's, let's, so what's your plan for the rest of the year? What, are you are you going back to South Africa? You're hanging around here? Potentially next year, maybe. Next we're still year. trying to keep whatever we're doing open. We uh, we we don't want to decide just yet, but we miss home a lot. We yeah. we, we do. It's it's beautiful beaches here, but it's hot for me. I yeah. sweat all the time. Yeah, it's man. a problem. Oh, man, it's a problem for me. I yeah. was born and raised here. It's, so, it's so rough. We'll probably head back next year, but okay. um, we, we see what life no brings traveling, us. No traveling, but not before then, not going to El Salvador. Uh, no, at, at this point right now, we're just trying to save as much right. as we can. And just, right. you know, just, 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 just experience the island at least as much as we can. Right. I went to the Botanical Gardens cool. a month or two ago. Cool. Beautiful. Yeah. Really loved it. There's yeah. so much to do here if you actually know where to go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, um, you yeah. just need a creative mind, you know? You just need to... You know, a lot of people are like, oh, there's nothing to do here. Nah, 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 nah. But it's like, you know, I, when I was young, my mom would tell me, a bored person is a boring person. You know, whenever, <laughs> whenever I tell her I was bored, and it just yeah. kind of, I, I still kind of agree with it. You know, as I much mean, as I hate it all the time. Right? It's no, like, you know, right. you can, you can, you can, find, you can come to the Bitcoin meetings. You know, indeed. Um, there's, there's lots of things. You can to join do. our cult. <laughs> you can join our cult, exactly. <laughs> oh yeah. Cool, man. Well, it's great to have you on. Thank you for having me. Thanks I really for, enjoyed for it. coming on. And yeah. I, I look forward to um, to chatting with you as as we move forward through you know the rest of the Bitcoin. See what happens. I think we're in for a very interesting year because now the the epochs ended. Stuff's going down. It's e- going to be interesting. ETFs are inflowing. Trump's about to make an announcement. It's, you know, everyone's like holding their breath. A lot of positive things I exactly. think happening for for Bitcoin. So, um, yeah, man. Thanks again for being on. Uh, thank you for having me.